All right, we are live. <laughs> Thank you for joining me, Jimmy, on a not a Saga Weiss and Fire live. <laughs> I mean, it's still a bit because I feel like <laughs> any live I'm in is Abercrombie. Any live you're in is a Saga Weiss and Fire. So we decided to just like purposely talk about that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's still lightly about both, right? We had to combine them. Yeah, and, and a bit of hop because that like creeps in. Yeah, and she's kind of like the best of both worlds, as we'll talk about. At least yeah. I feel that way. Or I feel, I mean, I go back and forth between like uh, being like, is Abercrombie a combo of Martin and Hob, or is Hob a combo of Abercrombie and Martin, or is Martin a combo of Hob and Abercrombie? <laughs> and there's a whole like shadow realm of of influences that we don't know, right? Because people yeah. keep some of those things close to their chest. But these three are in a lot also, of ways similar. You also don't even always know what influenced you. Like it's true. Anyway, if you'd like to introduce yourself for anyone who doesn't know who you are. Well, for anyone who doesn't know, I am Jimmy Nuts and I'm from the Fantasy Network. Uh, I do science fiction and fantasy reviews, mostly fantasy. Uh, and I also do a bi-weekly bookish podcast where I talk about nothing with a guest. And it's a lot of fun. And these are three of my favorite authors. All three of these authors would be my top five for sure. For yeah, sure. Same. So. Yeah, that's why they that's what they always come up. We're always comparing what we're reading to them. So, yeah, I, and I do feel like these are three of the authors that I know the most about. Um, I definitely think, you know, way more about Abercrombie than I do, though. You know uh, more about Martin than I do. So well, it's fair a good trade off and we meet somewhere <laughs> in the middle on Hob. Right. So that's perfect. Um, but that's why we always relate everything back to these authors. Like it's kind of a meme. Right. But you, you stick to what you know. And I think these are three people that could very well be on like the Mount Rushmore of modern day fantasy uh, and maybe of all time as well especially for us um so i think they're good benchmarks i do yeah but i think that's also why i mean if we feel that way they also have a lot of similarities between each other which is why we're like if you're gonna be great you have to be like them <laughs> because we keep comparing other people to them and saying they don't measure up and comparing them to each other and saying that's why they're great because they're all doing these things that are so great yeah um, and it, you know it's uh, one of the cool things is it's like they're so similar but the distinctions between them make them very easy to read in in you know either one after the other at the same time because they're still very distinct in their own right yeah. so well i think what's also quite uh, true of them is that even though we so often uh, you and i and also i think people in general you know lump them together compare them say if you like one you like the other but at no point if you picked up any of their books would you if you like you didn't see the cover and you didn't know what it was would you be like i can't tell if this is hob or martin or like they have very distinct authorial voices so yes. you know who you're reading as soon as you pick it up yes very much so um especially i would say even the most so with abercrombie what's on your shirt jimmy oh it's a mon mon cat shirt with a cat <laughs> painting on stripes on another cat it's pretty cool. and and you felt this was appropriate for this well, yeah. because <laughs> uh, well, actually, a, a bunch of my patrons bought this shirt, so then I also bought this shirt. So it's kind of like a club. So you need to get one next. Oh, okay, <laughs> I, you should have told me before the live. I didn't know there was a dress code. <laughs> I'm starting a cult. Yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> also, I just want you to know that every time I say your channel name in a video, in my brain, I'm like, it is not work. Because when I play back myself, like when I'm editing, it sounds like I'm saying network. <laughs> and every time I'm like, I swear I was saying not work. And I hear myself and it sounds, I'm like, he thinks that I don't know the actual name of his channel. And I swear I do. And I, I consciously, I'm like, not, not, not work. <laughs> and I'm like, Jimmy from the fantasy, not work. And it always sounds like network. Ooh, again. Whip. Yeah, you just have to, you have to really pronunciate the first part i i it's actually was work <laughs> i was gonna call it the fantasy network and then my uh friend who i was talking about he'd made all my graphics and stuff he's like no just call it the network and i'm like we that is fun. no one will get it and everyone does so we love right. fun yeah i'm all about but yeah fun. i'll just call it the fantasy newt work and make it like german <laughs> <laughs> then they'll know it's not network i like it <laughs> also i am shocked like i Stop reading Hob 22 times and read Abercrombie. <laughs> Just give him one cycle. I promise. Yeah. You, then you can add it to the rotation. <laughs> uh, and you can read. Maybe it'll bump off Ab uh, Hob and you'll be like me perennially rereading Abercrombie. It could happen. This is uh this is cool because so many people like there's some people saying I haven't read any Abercrombie. Some people say they haven't read any Hob yet. I mean, this could be a really cool opportunity to kind of uh, 
extend Chill the for hand. them. <laughs> yeah, extend the hand across the aisles, right? And and maybe get people fired up to read something else. Because like I said, I do think that the three of these have like a common uh, quality about, about them, right? Yeah, and obviously I don't think you can ever guarantee that if you like one thing, you're going to like another. Mm -hmm. But like, I, it would very much surprise me. Like if anyone is a fan of one of these authors that they would strongly dislike the other two. Like maybe you wouldn't love them all as much as you and I do. Maybe you would vastly prefer one to the other, but there is so much like about what they're interested in doing in storytelling that overlaps that I would truly be shocked if someone was like, I love Abercrombie and I cannot stand Hob. I'd be like, really? Like, what are you getting yeah. out of Abercrombie then? Like, what is it you're reading him for? Is it that it's stabby? Do you think he's an edgelord? Cause he's not, and you're not getting it. And you don't actually like first law. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would surprise me if, if um, there were a large amount of people that liked one of these and hated any of the others, maybe like not so much. So that, that would be fair, but uh, to, mm -hmm. to, have a disdain for any of the three would, would be interesting uh, outside of, of course, you know, output. Uh, Cause I know everyone hates George now, but you know, as far as actual talent, he's pretty great. Which one book should you read as your single read? Uh, well, start with the blade itself and then, yeah. then just keep going. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so Hobbes is the one they haven't read. I'm looking and I think I've seen more, not Hobbs than not anything else. Well, I know Amanda's in. Uh, so Beth says she DNF'd Martin. Amanda is saying, I, I knew Amanda did not like Joe Abercrombie. Uh, maybe we can pull her back because um, I, going, so I, I did some analysis uh, for, for the show because this is a fun topic. I, I've been learning more. We're here to tell everybody that if they only like one of these authors and not the others, they're wrong. They must have <laughs> Uh, but I do think like this conversation is really interesting just because of what it's about. And it's about writing. Right. And what when you really start to dig in, because I, I do think that you can pick these things up as you read. But when you go back to certain things and you analyze sentence by sentence, a piece of a story, you can see a lot of what the author is doing to make you feel the way you're feeling. And I have to say of the three, when I went to the piece that I decided to do analysis on for Abercrombie, I was the most blown away because I forgot um, how good his prose is. Um, and hopefully when we uh, kind of dive in on it, we can break it down in a way that people can see what he's doing and why we appreciate it so much. Um, and I think Abercrombie's prose gets a little bit underrated because people believe that prose is only flowery lyrical prose. Yeah. That's the only, but it's so much more than that. It's where you put your periods. It's uh, where you put the action and the verb, you know, in a sentence. Uh, th there's... It's like, it's not just more words. It's the right words. It's the right words. And it's how you structure your sentences. Uh, there, there's a lot to the craft and prose mm -hmm. is such a vast, vast thing. And I mean, I'm obviously I'm biased because Abercrombie of the three is my favorite, but I do think of the three, his prose is arguably the most artful, like has those like quotes that you're just like, oh, the way you just, oh, that, that sentence, like the like double mm -hmm. meanings and like wordplay you just did there. Like I, the, I find that in, in Hobb and in, in Martin as well, but I feel like Abercrombie takes great pleasure <laughs> in like crafting sentences that have like witty word combinations yeah he also does an extraordinarily good job of picking his sentence length depending on what he's depicting in the scene um so and which the, character's uh, voice he is trying to oh like. yes the the one common theme among all three of these authors is that their command over perspective choice is mm -hmm. extraordinarily strong and the character voices are very 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 strong mm -hmm. um th these would be people that you would probably share as examples of holding perspective um, all three are really great and all three do it in a very different way. George has a very um, exposition -y type approach, whereas Abercrombie is very direct dialogue heavy. And then Hobb uh, is in the first person, which makes it a lot different. Um, but they're all very, very commanding with their perspective choices. Yeah. And character voice. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. We're. I mean, sorry again, I would say Abercrombie is like the most where like as soon as first sentence in a chapter, you're like, okay, so I'm Glock, I'm in Glock's perspective. Like, you know, yeah. immediately. Well, actually, uh, the thing I did on the analysis, like when I went back and started looking, uh, is actually I wanted to see, because all three of these writers, people consider to be very good character writers, I would say in general, right? Um, 
I want to kind of go over what each of them do for characters, because mm -hmm. I think that it's really important to look why we think they're strong. And I, and I, I also, I mean, in addition to, I think it's also important. I mean, obviously we're going to be talking a lot of similarities, but also like mm -hmm. they're very different also. And that doesn't yes. mean that it's because like, Oh, that's because, you know, he's really good at this and the other they're weaker at that. It's not necessarily that like they also have different projects in mind and different approaches to things. So they, like the if you're gonna say Hob is so similar to these two, so should be she should she be shelved in Grimdark? No, I don't think she should. And yet I still think she's very similar to Martin and Abercrombie, who absolutely yeah. should be shelved in Grimdark. Yeah, and I think that so like with, especially and I'll I'll kind of focus on Abercrombie first, but he's constantly <laughs> touted as a really great character writer, and I think there's a lot of head nodding going on, but people don't really think about like why is that? Uh, but I don't think it's so much that it, it's not so much. It, we should acknowledge that he's a strong character writer, but it's also his character work is beyond nuanced. It's, it's very compelling because he keeps theme and tone with the narrative in the world consistent with whatever perspective he's in. And Abercrombie is a lot more blunt than the other two when it comes to Martin and Hobb, but that's because it's his style. Like he's very direct in his approach and it allows for Joe to flesh out other pieces around that character. So he gets a lot of mileage out of his paragraphs um, and it sets a scene a scene setting can relay all of the characters demeanor in the first two paragraphs and it's pretty amazing uh, and I think it's like one of the best examples of why his prose is really really good well also I mean I think uh, you kind of made me think of this and what you were saying that um, it, how so how it how it is that you do great character work like so you say that they do but you know what is the mechanism of that like what is it that makes it good and I mean I think you're absolutely right about Abercrombie but also it's not just you know having like dialogue of characters be really like distinct or anything like that there are so many pieces to that that are like adjacent to it that support the character work you're doing and so yes the way in which they each approach using other pieces to support their character work is not the same, but they're all right. three good at finding ways to support their character work through things that are technically not character work, if that makes sense. So like, yes, I think uh, Abercrombie doesn't really do like, I think, so I think George R. R. Martin is able to deliver a lot of world building information in character dialogue and also deliver like the fact that these characters would be, either aware of this or not aware of this or interested in this or not interested in this, like yeah. through doing that. And is like, that's why the world building is delivered so organically because the character work is organic and they're like, it's like a symbiotic relationship and Abercrombie. Well, he does deliver world building information through dialogue, but like, he does do that. I think more it's a case of like, so for example, like the best example is like, you don't really see the Agriant described until Logan gets to the Agriant because everyone who's already in the Agriant wouldn't notice it because you live there. Right. And so it's only when he shows up and is describing it to you in that sort of like othering way, the way that like, you know, when you go to a foreign country and you're like, what is this? He's describing it and being like, what the heck is this? Like having the, what the characters notice, what they would pick up on, what they would talk about is like a lot of, and so you get a description of the world that way, but mostly you have to like, it's how Logan is approaching it and being befuddled by it and baffled by what he is seeing. That's mainly ca Logan's character development, but you're also for the first time getting your description of what this place actually looks like. Yeah. And that's, that's productive writing. That's very productive writing. It doesn't take a break really from um, the pace, right? Uh, or the narrative. It, it can, it, it's all kind of blended in. Um, and he does this with his introduction of Glotka. Actually, is it okay if I read the introduction of Glotka? Is that cool? <laughs> Be my guest. I'm not the best narrator. You don't have to ask permission to talk about Glockta. <laughs> Listen, I'm no Pacey, but I want to read this. And, um, but you know, I'd the, require you to do a lisp. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if you listen to this introduction, folks, I really think you can hear and see what kind of the point of Leanna just made is how much mileage he gets out of these two paragraphs. Uh, and they're very short. But why do I do this? Inquisitor Glotka asked himself for the thousandth time as he limped down the corridor. The walls were uh, rendered and whitewashed, though none too recently. There was a seedy feel to the place and a smell of uh, damp. There were no windows. As the hallway was deep beneath the ground, the lanterns cast slow flowing shadows into every corner. Why would anyone want to do this? Glocka's walking made a steady rhythm on the grimy tiles of the floor. First, the confident click of his right heel, then the tap of his cane, then the endless sliding of his left foot with the similar stabbing pains in the, in the ankle, knee, ass and back click tap pain that was the rhythm of his walking so um whereas a lot of people would slowly reveal these things 
We know Glotka is now an Inquisitor. This is the first time he ever shows up. He's an Inquisitor. He's crippled. Um, he is having a really tough time getting around. But this is the cool, this is the cool part. The walls were rendered and whitewashed, though none too recently. A little bit broken down. A little bit dreary. There was a seedy feel to the place and a smell of damp. There were no windows. We're getting very much a different tone um, from the prologue, right? This is a very closed in space, very dark. Um, it says, you know, grimy tiles on the floor. So he's describing all these things through the mind of Glotka. And even um, just the fact that instead of going on and on and on, in, in, I mean, he does have long internal monologues later for sure. But just saying, why do I do this? Like, you don't, you already know. He's like disgruntled, upset, like yes. doesn't like his job is clearly not his passion. Like you yes. know so much just from the fact that his introduction is, why do I do this? Click tap pain. Like you already know so much about Glaxa. Yes. And, and the atmosphere described around him, if you think about it in Glaxa's perspective, this is a guy who is very gloomy. This guy does not look at the bright side of things at all. He noticed every single negative detail about the world around him. Nitpickery. Yeah. And this is very different uh, from Martin and Hobb because Hobb mm -hmm. is really, really big on about dialogue. Um, and it's generally due because of Fitz's first person perspective. Um, Although even in the live ship traders, there's a lot of dialogue. Absolutely. And through those, uh, you get characters introduced, usually see how they react to a certain situation, uh, like Burich is introduced. And I think he's arguing with um, a guy named Jason, I think. And he uh, Jason is basically questioning chivalry's worth. He's showing off Fitz, saying you have to take care of him because you were chivalry's man. Chivalry, you know, could never have an heir. Now he has a bastard, da, 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 da. But we learn a lot about Burich on the way he responds in front of Fitz. And he goes kind of at Jason and is like, what did you? What did you, you talking to me? You talking to me? Um, but all this is through the eyes of Fitz, which demands a very strong hand on the perspective. And Hobb is one of the very best at it. Erickson uh, said during the interview I had with him that when he teaches workshops, he uses Hobb as a example of holding perspective. He thinks that she's like just absolutely terrific. Um, and and I, I would agree, especially after reading this passage that I was looking at today. Um, she doesn't give us like a ton of information, but if you look back on the way Burich is introduced through Fitz's eyes, it actually says a lot. <laughs> it says a lot about uh, Burich because it says his eyes met mine. There, there was a sort of wildness in them as if what he saw in my face were an injury I had done to him. I started to draw away from that look, but his grip wouldn't let me go. So I stared back at him with as much defiance as I could muster and saw his upset mass suddenly with a sort of reluctant wonder. And lastly, he closed his eyes for a second, hooding them against some pain. It's a thing that will try her lady's will to the edge of her very name, Birch said softly. That is a really good introduction to Birch because of the wildness in his eyes uh, and things that we end up learning about Birch down the road. But also, this kind of sets up the entire tone for Fitz <laughs> in Birch's relationship in Farseer. Yeah, for sure. Well, I also, <clears throat> this made me think of another thing they all three do well, and that is delivering information to the reader, even if the characters that you're reading from aren't picking that up. Yeah. So like, just because your POV character is either like too distracted or too dumb or like not putting those pieces together, that doesn't mean that you, the reader, can't be delivered that information. So there is, I mean, Fitz is your only POV for all of the Farce Year trilogy. And there is so much information that you have that Fitz doesn't, even though he's your only eyes on this world. Because, like, she's putting information there that he is not picking up, and you are. Yes, and, and reading between yeah. the lines is very big in, in that series. And mm -hmm. another thing I really enjoy about Hob is that you're not always supposed to agree with Fitz. Uh, and that is another really good example of having a commanding hand in perspective. Well, I mean, that can be said again for all three where like they are all three like perfect examples of you can write a character and there's a difference between portraying and condoning. And like when people talk about reading a book uh, and I do that as well, when you talk about a book and you're like, this came off really misogynistic, this came off really sexist, I'm like, well, that's just the character. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but there's a difference. And you can tell like when I read about Giselle, at no point do I think that Abercrombie thinks this is fine. And also, it's not because Giselle is sitting there introspecting and being like, am I the baddie? Like, no, like he thinks what he's doing is fine. And we're in his perspective. And yet I never doubt that Abercrombie does not think that's fine. And the same is true when I read a song of ice and fire the same is true like i mean fitz isn't a giselle but like yeah as you say like fitz does things 
that I know I'm not meant to agree with or approve of or, or whatever. And it's not because the author had to come out and say, see that that was bad. <laughs> like, like you don't have to do that, but there's also a difference between showing a character being a character um, and still writing it in a way where you're, it's clear that this is not necessarily meant to be a good thing or. A... Yeah. A lot of times uh, they let it read you, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and how you react to it uh, likely says more about you than the, than the character. Uh, and I Absolutely. think those are the best questions that an author can pose through characters is um, the ones that don't necessarily need to be answered in the, in the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, Often the questions that you don't answer are much more intriguing. Like the, I and I think that's, again, all three of them are really good at doing that where I tend to dislike fantasy books that feel a need to answer every question that tell you everything about the world building, everything about the history, everything about everything, because they've thought of everything. And by golly, they are going to tell you everything that they have figured out for their own world. And I'm like, I'm really proud of you. And I'm really happy for you. But this makes it feel fake. Because yeah. you've like, this is the box of the world. And there's nothing unknown. And there's nothing further to explore. Because you've told me these are the rules. And this is the history. And like, ugh, no. Like, well, even yeah. when... Uh, I asked Abercrombie, like, if he'd ever do a prequel type stuff, you know, like, uh, go back, you know, other ages of the world. And he's like, why? Like, why would I do that? And I was like, I don't know, you know, to see if uh, the things we've heard are true or whatever. And he's like, but would that make it better? Wouldn't that ruin it? If you went back and you saw either that it was or it wasn't or whatever, like, wh what would be the point of that? Isn't it so much more interesting that you don't know? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I asked. <laughs> don't do a prequel. <laughs> <laughs> also, a, spe a room for speculation is, is a very good key to growing a fandom. Um, it's actually one of the things about A Song of Ice and Fire that is alive. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. But also uh, things I think people have gotten a little unruly with expecting every single little thing to be answered if, if it were ever to be finished. Um, and I think people are, have lost sense of what is realistic. Um, like we don't have to have every little thing confirmed. We, we, and it would be kind of crappy if it was. Yes, that is correct. Uh, but you know, when you have 10 years, a lot of people get pet theories and things and they say, I, this is the one thing I need, you know, uh, which might not be all that important for the overall narrative. So. And it is interesting to know sometimes if an author in an interview says that, well, it's not ever confirmed in the books, but in their head, like headcanon is like that that's the case. Um, but if there's no, like, for example, if you have a character who knows a thing that and only they know it and they die, then there's yeah. no actual way for your story, unless you have some like deus ex machina, like, you know, magic reason why this information gets to be known. Like it just sometimes knowledge dies with people and that makes the world feel more real that this never gets known or confirmed because the one person that knew it died before they could share it. And that's just how it be sometimes. And that knowledge got lost. Um, yeah. And uh, sometimes you don't have the big heroic last words on the, on the pyre. Uh, usually you don't. You don't. <laughs> yeah. We get 90% of the time you don't. And all three of these authors definitely go with that route. I think um, there's a lot more real realistic. I, I don't like using that word. You have to be realistic. <laughs> have to be realistic. Um, but yeah. And we kind of talked about Hob and, joe's approach to characters and, and when we were talking earlier about you know no, what do you know in what perspective i think that's where george shines the most uh mm -hmm. information is george's strong suit which is why uh he is not afraid to go into exposition uh but his exposition through his characters is valuable because he scopes it to that perspective um it's not a big dump of you know, someone who shouldn't know something knowing all or saying, oh, of course, you know, or that someone me. who wouldn't be noticing the things like, yes. you know, if you have a, a young character or a poor character or a dumb character, like and you're they have eyes on something, but they wouldn't understand it, then they don't. <laughs> yeah. And one of the times where George does this really, really well is actually Tyrion's introduction into the series because he's introduced in Ned's POV. Uh, and Ned is about to meet Robert, right? And these aren't spoilers, folks. Um, this happens like first three chapters. Um, but Ned is thinking about King Robert and the news that he's received about John Aaron. And he almost looks as Tyrion as like kind of a joke. Like he's like a side thing. Like, oh, there's the imp walking behind like the king's camp. Who cares? Um, and it's all through Ned's POV. So we see that. And you would think if you just read that, you would say, oh, that Tyrion's not a big deal. But we see something totally different from John's POV when John leaves the feast and then Tyrion does the tumble off. 
and we see that it makes a ghost back up and say, oh, like this, this, this dwarf is, is a big deal, different, very menacing. Uh, and also we get to actually hear some really good Tyrion dialogue as well. That's like one of the best exchanges in the first book. Um, but it's very much in line with Gurm's style and is a launching point to understanding all of the story and history that he wants to build is that different perspectives throughout history are going to give you different interpretations and who is a good guy and who is the bad guy. And that is definitely the best part, in my opinion, of uh, George's character work. So like in the same vein, but also a very different version of what you're talking about. Cause like, again, one of my favorite things is when you get, you know, differing reports on things. And I think in a, one of our song of ice and fire chats, we, when I talked about potentially one of the reasons why I feel less interested in Daenerys part of the story, a lot of the time is because we don't have differing reports about what's going on there. We only have her. And so like, as, as interesting as that can be, it's always more interesting when I have like a lot of different perspectives yes. on the same place and time. So like if I had more eyes on that telling me maybe the same, but also conflicting things, but, um, yes. but point, the point I was actually going to make <laughs> is that, uh, like uh, the part, um, this is, uh, I'll make it non spoiler. So there's uh, a convergence of perspectives that stays together for a large chunk of Before They Are Hanged, the second book of the first law trilogy. And like these perspectives, you get them all and they're all like in the same place and they're all seeing each other and you constantly flip between them and you hear their perspectives on what's happening and on each other. And when I was talking to Bethany about it, I likened it to like one of those like one room plays, like in, in theater, when like, the story of the play happens in one room where just people are just talking and the story unfolds from there for like this entire play. And that's kind of what it's like, like these characters and how their, per, their dynamics are changing, their knowledge of what's happening is changing. They have very different ideas of each other, of what's happening, of what they want out of it and how that morphs and changes and like stuff happens like along the way, but there's not really that much stuff happening. What the stuff that is happening is their interactions with each other. Yeah. Yeah, Abercrombie's convergences of uh, POVs and characters is always interesting too because I've I, <laughs> you want to know what Glotka thinks of somebody, and then he finally meets them, and you're like, oh, snap. and you know the fact that you know that he's going to have individual thoughts that aren't just kind of you know laid out among all of the POVs. Oh, we all know that Giselle was a great knight, you know, not so much. Like this guy's a dingus. This guy's a boob. So, um. Scott Scott actually said something. Uh, I love when Cersei and Tyrion are talking and Clash paraphrase Cersei. I didn't think of that. Father did. Cersei is a great example of not just trusting a POV when they talk. Because I'm going to be honest, years and years ago when I first read A Song of Ice and Fire, I thought Cersei was a schemer and a genius. She is a schemer. That is actually. <laughs> she is a schemer. It's whether not she's a, good at it. <laughs> not a great one. Um, but when I first read through these books, I'll be honest, I thought she was like, I was like, oh, she's great at the Game of Thrones. Da, 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 da. And then you reread and you go. Boy, she had you fooled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're like, she's an idiot. You can't trust her when she when she has these thoughts, you know, um, she doesn't make all the great the best moves. Um, That's another example of like showing you things um, that the character whose head you're in isn't seeing, but you are seeing like the stuff that Cersei sees around her and is thinking about and is encountering her take on it. You as the reader are like, mm, OK, uh, no, it's not what I got out of that. <laughs> and that's how humans are. I mean, mm -hmm. we me and you could read the same headline and feel very differently about it, right? But I feel um, like a lot of books like take, I don't know, they make the mistake of filtering everything too much through the character. And I mean, like, that's, I, don't know, I feel like I said I'm contradicting myself because filtering everything through the character is what makes it a good character POV and voice. But at the same time, like you can sneakily convey information that is like in direct opposition to what this character notices, thinks or feels and still have the reader see it and be like, oh, you are wrong. <laughs> Yes, and Ketcha and and Hob does this very well um, with a scene in their very first book. Um, she does it with a, an entire character dynamic in the second and third books, mm -hmm. where you are like, "I know what's happening," and you don't. <laughs> That's really obvious. <laughs> yeah, I, the restriction of information is something that I think that uh, Martin and Hob do extraordinarily well. Martin set it up interestingly enough through um, sending a raven. Um, that that is kind of a big deal, right? And, and and sending the notes through the air because you can actually tell information doesn't travel very fast in this world. So sometimes you get into so you a get to season eight, and then <laughs> well, that's why that's why very we're fast. talking strictly about the source material. Um, 
but yeah, I, I think the restriction of information uh, is a really fun thing to play with as an author, but a lot of people don't do it. And another thing that a lot of authors don't do that these three definitely do uh, is letting things fail. Obviously, this happens and before they are hanged. <laughs> but this also say, like the most obvious one who's like intentionally doing that. Yeah. And most of the drama in these books come from our characters messing up. Uh, yeah, Fitz is always making bad decisions. <laughs> um, uh, Martin, uh, a lot of the drama and things that catapult this into a, dis a disaster for these characters is the fact that someone was overconfident in their skills or or, um, you know, they messed up, they made the wrong decision, trust the wrong person. Uh, and then, like I said, Abercrombie is all about making his characters mess up uh, and getting diverted on a trip or such. I, mean, I know you haven't read the King Killer Chronicle yet, but Kvothe is kind of like if Fitz was uh, an arrogant prodigy. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> but like suffers just as much and makes just as many poor decisions. <laughs> and, and there are a lot of authors that do do these things, by the way. So like, I don't want anyone to think that we're just saying only these three can do these, these things. Um, you know, I know I think Christopher Rocchio does this also extraordinarily well. I think Erickson does this very well. There's, there's a, there's probably a thousand more, but I was going to say when we, well, when we were talking about character perspectives on other characters, that was, uh, to bring in a different author. Um, every time I've met Pierce Brown, he always asks, who's mm -hmm. your favorite character? Like when you like go up to like shake his hand, he's like, Hey, you know, great for coming. Like, who's your favorite character? And like, I'd met him so many times and always like, that's like a thing he asks. And I was like, I don't have a favorite character. Like I can't answer that. And so then like with the new books, the second trilogy, it is no longer just Darrow's perspective. It is multi POV. Mm -hmm. And so for the first time you see Darrow through someone else's eyes, it's not Darrow on Darrow thinking about Darrow being Darrow. Like, not only do you see something else, which is refreshing, but you get to see Darrow through somebody else's eyes. And that's never happened before. So I told him, I was like, I don't have a favorite character, but I love seeing Darrow through someone else's eyes now for the first time. Yeah. Um, because that is so... Having different perspectives on a character, on a, an event, a situation, a place, whatever, like, that really fleshes out your world when, like, you get different perspectives on things. You know what's even, you know, it's another like kind of shade of that is when you never get a POV from a character. Like a character remains a, almost a mystery. Um, a really good example of this would be the fact that we never get a true like Stannis POV in a song of ice and fire. We see Stannis from the people around him. And we, and I think we actually get a really good indication of like how he's viewed by the people. But there are definitely times where I would have loved to seen the mental turmoil inside of Stannis's head. But keeping that at a distance is actually more beneficial in, in, in a lot of ways. I think this is kind of the same case with like Robert Baratheon. Um, Tywin. And, Ty, Baez. Baez would definitely be one for First Law, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to. I, I mean, I would love to see inside Baez's head, but it's it's almost more mis mysterious. Yeah. Well, it's the same Ryan. answer as like why you wouldn't write a prequel. You're like, it's yes. it's. You want to know, but you only want to know because you don't know. And if you did know, you wouldn't care. <laughs> like, yeah. There's even um, a line about that um, that Glockta says in uh, in the third book, and this isn't spoilery. It's just him reflecting on like how he feels about this. That um, when he gets like some reveals and discovers the answers to some of his questions, he's like, oh, and it's like it's like a letdown. And he's like, answers are boring though. It's questions questions are interesting and i was like yeah you're not wrong because the answer is always like there's so many possibilities with a question is it you is it you is it this is it that will it be this will it be that are you connected to this when you get the answer you're like i mean yeah that that checks out but that's hmm. it okay kind of yeah. reminds me of a hob quote uh <laughs> in, in in one of the books where she says uh death is i think it's hob i hope i, I hope i'm right I might be wrong Daryl, will tell me if i'm wrong but uh that death isn't the opposite of life but death is just the end of being able to make choices it's like, oh, right. yeah, that sounds Oof. familiar. Yeah, and I mean, I, I made a said earlier, you know, that Abercrombie is like the better word player, but there are absolutely quotable quotes in all three. They are all great wordsmiths. Oh, definitely. I, I, I think they're three of the most quotable authors. Me uh, Megan says, The Fool is my all time favorite character, but I'd never want a chapter from his perspective. Yes. This is a great, that's a phenomenal example. Someone said Rake and Malaz, and that's another one. Well, I was going to say, none of the mind. three ever make the mistake that like Disney made of like making Jack Sparrow the main character because they all three realize that these characters work 
on the side because you don't know what they're doing. You don't know what they're thinking. And it's and you want to know. But like, that's what makes it good is that you want to know. But yes, it's the answer to that is like, well, they say they want to know. So I should write what you know, no, because we don't actually want to know. Like once we know, we won't be into it. Yeah. And that that is definitely like whenever I've attempted to write, that's always been like a really difficult thing is like not giving all the information away. And I think uh, George Martin gets a lot of crap for doing exposition history uh kind of lore paragraphs um, but he doesn't do it as in but he's still very organic in how he delivers most of his world building yeah and i do feel like it has a rich historical feel to it um where you know it is exposition but one thing that i hear all the time is oh this had a big block of exposition that isn't a bad thing you can do it properly you I was can say do it's it not well. necessarily a bad thing it can yes be. just like a uh, deus ex machina that can be a bad mm -hmm. thing it does. It can actually be done. Well, well I think you and I talked about this in, in a song of ice and fire or live about how like there is no thing that you should never do. There's a lot of things that are like they go badly more often than not. So like people would that's why people say don't do it because like pulling it off is harder. But there's nothing that could never be pulled off by the right author. Yes, absolutely. And uh, those kind of conventions are important to to push on the boundaries. Um yeah, Martin feels like historical fiction happens to be fantasy. I, I am starting to see uh, people love just like retconning George out of existence for some reason. Uh, but people are I've actually seen people saying this. And Matt, I know you're not saying this just to be clear, but I've seen uh, new detractors from George say he actually doesn't even write fantasy. He actually just copied. Well, they're Lord probably Lord. the same people that say it's actually not grimdark. And you're like, what uh, sure, are you even sure. About? Um, it's also just silly because, I mean, we we've now reread the first five and mm -hmm. I think we almost went, you know, two to three hours on each book. And if you really look into those, uh, you can see that there's a lot more than the parallel to history. Oh, you stole this. It, it's uh, it's a little disingenuous. to say I mean, that. you can make the same case for Abercrombie, especially in the age of madness. He's obviously pulling from the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution. So Definitely. like you find then he's a hack, too, who is just rewriting. French and history. to pretend that there isn't a lot of of inventive things around that is ridiculous. And, you know, people say, well, someone else had actually uh, done, you know, this kind of thing where characters were in danger. Like that's been done before. And it's like, sure but it's still really good like i i know that there are other authors that have attempted this thing prior but there has to be a reason why it resonated with the zeitgeist like it did yeah and actually um i it think when we were talking about like why the out of the three the one that gets the like award for character work all the time that people expressly call that out or say he's the best out i mean i say it all the time too and but i also think the other two are good at it but they don't quite get that accolade specifically as often and I think they're of the three, if they're, you know, the weak point of Abercrombie, if this is something that you're interested in, he doesn't actually care that much about like lore building. Like Correct. he is not well, that's not what he's doing. And so like when it comes to like what you are like delving and when you're picking it apart and when you're analyzing and discussing it, like we've spent three hours on each Song of Ice and Fire book. Yes, talking about character work, no doubt, but also being like, what does this mean for the magic? What does this mean for the world? Is this mm -hmm. secretly this? And is this going to amount to this? And with Abercrombie, that's not to say there's none of that, but like he's, even with that stuff, he's more interested in just like throwing out a question that'll never be answered to make you go, oh, I wonder what that is that I'll never know. <laughs> I would <laughs> and... even say that Abercrombie, at least the new trilogy kind of felt predictable. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. Um, every single thing I thought would happen in the third book happened. And I was, it made, it made sense. Yeah. And I mean, in that sense too, um, and George R. R. Martin is, I think, famous for saying something. I mean, I'm going to paraphrase, but like, if you wrote your story that the butler did it, and then you see online that someone figured out that the butler did it, you don't suddenly make it that the maid did it because everything you wrote is setting up that the butler did it. So the <laughs> butler did it. Like, and so I think like, there's a. Uh, it's satisfying if you did piece something together and then it ends up being that it's not like, Oh, they guessed it. It can't be that. Why not? Like you no. put clues there. And we figured out reward the fact that we figured it out. <laughs> Predictable is actually a good thing. And I think Again, the reason to an extent, or it can be a good thing. <laughs> can be bad for sure. But if you're I writing think... just a thriller. That's like entirely just a thriller. And you're like, I saw the answer on the first page. I mean, that's probably, <laughs> probably not, <laughs> probably not doing the genre any justice. Right. Um, I think also when you look back, a lot of the big oh my god moments for me in Realm of the Elderlings and A Song of Ice and Fire 
if I go back and read again, you can see how it's piecing out and you go, how did I not see this happening? <laughs> Nothing else could have happened. Like this is the only real outcome. Maybe I just didn't want to see it. Um, so I definitely don't think that that's even exclusive to Joe. Um, but you, like you said, Joe has a lot less going around the events, right? There's not a lot well, I mean, of even, so like, exposition when you're like, so it's this, you know, I've, I'm excited for the day that I'm rereading Rumble the Elderlings with uh, now that I know, <laughs> like I'm excited about that. But I obviously have that already for Abercrombie. Yeah. And the thing is, like, it's it is, I guess, a bit to do with some like lore and magic, but it's not. It's more about character motivations being unclear. And then you later, like, now that you know where everything went, the thing that you are piecing together isn't like the magic of the world and how it connects. It's like what everybody was up to. Yeah. And like what they were when they were saying things and meaning something else. And when they said a throwaway thing that you're like, what does that mean? And then you later figure it out. And like, it's not what does that mean? Because it's a magical, mystical prophecy. It's because, you know, it's 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 always character focused. And I think, again, that's why he gets that he's the best at character with yeah. accolade, because that's the thing he's most interested in. And like magic is like also there. <laughs> like, that's not really what he cares about. And all three of these would be considered low magic for the most part. Um the, especially compared to a lot more of the uh, modern stuff, right? Actually, so, Age of Madness is higher magic than almost any other Abercrombie before. Yeah, that's true. Because one of your main POV characters is a magic user. Yeah, and they do both feel, or all three kind of feel like it's, well, I would say in Age of Madness, it's actually supposedly going out of style, right? Like that's kind of the, the theme, but they magic all kind of- is fading from the world yes. as it always is in all of these stories. Back in the day, there used to be wizards aplenty. <laughs> but it's interesting because Realm of the Elderlings is almost like, not, not even a resurgence, but we've lost a lot of the information that let us know how this is supposed to work. Uh, and that's why they, you know, they have- I can't spoil anything, but there's masters, right? And, and all these things. But, and also the red comet in a song of ice and fire signifies magic coming back into the world. Um, so I think it's interesting as a human in our world, reading a story where magic is kind of coming back or being used more because it's a little bit easier to suspend your belief. Because I mean, I think there's a reason there. so many books have the magic is gone and we're trying to find it again because if magic's around all the time, what's your story about? Like, yeah, it's, of course, that's uh, people make fun of it, but there's a reason it's like that. But um, I think this is an interesting parallel. I don't you'll have to tell me if it's true for Hobbes as well. But both Martin and Abercrombie are heavily influenced by film. And so like not to say that that is the reason that we find similarity in their writing, but they're, you know, and, and like when I've before I've identified specific character types or beats or plot lines in Fi First Law that I'm like, I know you are a fan of A Song of Ice and Fire. And this kind of reminds me of A Song of Ice and Fire. That's not to say you're copying it, but you some some of it might be directly influenced by it but you two like there's a reason joe abercrombie resonated so much with a song of ice and fire because they are kindred spirits like-minded interested in similar things like they're both history buffs they both like writing grimdark people with grimdark mode like they think similarly so there's going to be similarity even if they're not directly influenced by each other or they are directly influenced by each other. but anyway the film thing also is like another layer like they're both interested in film and like have worked in film and that I think people have talked about their writing feeling cinematic or being influenced by that. And that's a similarity. Yeah. I think, I think that those two definitely have more of a cinematic uh, episodic touch in some ways, like at the close of chapters and things like this, like you can see very clear episode endings, but I do not think Hob is actually. I was going to say last night when Namar and I were talking about Hob and we were talking about, so should it be adapted? Could it be adapted? And I was like, could it, I mean, yes but i feel like the odds of it going badly are so high because like i it could be done but like fitz talking to night eyes could be like i don't know how you don't i think that live stupid. ship is what you adapt but um, even then like the ship talking ships could be so thomas the tank engine if you listen, do it badly and like we had we had we had talking trees in lord of the rings All that's right. what i'm saying like if you have a good showrunner a good creative director if you have the right cgi but if you don't it could look super dumb. That, I mean, anything could be bad, right? I mean, but there's that, nothing it, in first law that's like that, where like this is going to be a weird magic thing that looks really stupid because it's so low magic that like you basically just have to have like armor swords and a good amount of like fake blood budget that like you don't <laughs> need think, a lot of. No, uh, first law's uh, hurdle 
will be being compared to Game of Thrones, like every fantasy, but even more so because there is a and, and actually I'd, I've never asked you this, so I'm going to ask you now. Um, we're talking about how similar these authors are. I don't find a song of ice and fire and first law to be as connected as everyone else does. Like there's clearly similarities, but like, for instance, people saying, I hope Joe finishes the series. And in my head, I'm like, I hope he does not because Joe Abercrombie has way too strong of an authorial voice, uh, to go and work in someone else's world. And I mean, I, I think we talked about, you know, like for one, stop asking people to finish George R. R. Martin series. He's alive and he doesn't want anyone to do this. So yeah, stop it. Pretty rude. But OK, if we are going to talk about that, which we shouldn't. But OK, if we are, I mean, this would be highly imperfect, but Hob would be a better candidate like for it than Abercrombie because yeah. the types of like heavy, slow, patient w- lore and world building that Martin is doing is more akin to Hobb. Abercrombie is just does not care about that in terms of his own writing. Like I find Hobb and I agree with you. I find Hobb and George to be closer than Abercrombie to either of the other two, actually. Yeah. Well, I feel like uh, if I, I guess if I was going to put one, I, that's why I keep going back and forth. Like who do I connect to who? Cause like, <laughs> I do think, I don't know. Cause I think, they're similar to each other for different reasons, you know? Yes. So then if like, depends on what we're talking about, I'll be like, oh, these two are the same and this one's not. And then we're talking about something. Well, these two are the same and this one's not. So like. thematically, I think George and Joe are very close. And I think the character work of Hobb and Abercrombie are very close. Like I think the distinct, like not that Martin's bad at it, but like they are both stronger in that than Martin, I think. Yeah. So yeah, I think that Hobb and Joe are very similar in their craft. Um, now when you, they write, they're very different, but they, they know their sentences are very direct. Um, and they both can say a lot with saying a little, which is a very important skill to have (laughs) if you're going to write some fantasy books, I think I wish more people had that ability. Um, so I find Hobb and Joe's writing to be more similar, uh, than Martin and anyone else. But I always thought thematically. I feel like people have leveled this criticism at both Hobb and Abercrombie and much less so to Martin saying that like, oh, you just have to push through because once you get through it, it makes sense and it rewards you and it pays off. But you just have to like get through all of the where is this going? Like obviously Abercrombie gets that a lot, but also like when people talk about Assassin's Quest and about like just like, I feel like that is a thing people say that like, oh, it drags and like nothing's happening. And like, why is it taking so long for anything to happen? And everyone's like, oh, just like you have to like, just bear with it because which it drives me insane you. by the way i just want to put that <laughs> but i feel out. like people don't say that specifically about george r. r martin so much no i think people's uh bigger issue with george is the approach um and also like his it, isn't finished yet so no one can be like wait till you right. get to the end <laughs> i mean i think george is a lot more akin to the older uh, him and hob do, do do this a lot um but they're, they're more akin to a day before modern fantasy i was saying out of the three Edward. abercrombie well i think he is also the youngest like just in age but yeah. he also feels the newest sure. like most modern in his storytelling the other two feel a little bit more like oh he was awesome. very much a a, a new gen like what they saw they said oh song of ice and fire is big we need something new and sexier and th- this was the thing now i don't mean that some people hear i was that gonna say and before they're hanged do we i is that sexy oh, <laughs> no doubt uh, i think that that was uh the appropriate void to be filled um you know and, and and right now right brandon sanderson's the number one selling author in fantasy uh if you don't count sarah j mass uh and they're looking for the next brandon sanderson that's a little different more digestible probably a little shorter but we still want that that really interesting magic and stuff like that. So these trends happen. Well, and Crombie was and Brandon trend. Sanderson is kind of writing the coattails of what Marvel did with the shared, connected, epic, huge, big magic universe. Yes. Where, like, I mean, that goes all the way back to Asimov because that's mm-hmm. actually who, um, who he first saw do an interconnected universe. Cause the robots and foundation are connect spoiler, I guess if you haven't, read those um but not really but th- that was uh what kind of inspired him so it-, it goes even further back um to that i don't think people realize they liked interconnected universes in the in the zeitgeist until marvel though or also i mean just the that you would have so many different things that are all connected in ways that people would have to put together and pay attention to mm-hmm. like i don't think people realize that a general audience has the bandwidth and interest to do that until marvel did it where it's like a very mainstream thing where people are putting the pieces together with all these separate movies how they're actually connected and how it all does eventually come together where like worlds collide and that like 
you know, nerd culture became mainstream. So like having a shared universe like the Cosmere, like I don't think anyone would have thought that that was like viable in terms of like wide market success before Marvel did that and was like the average Joe is excited to see like the epic shared universe coming together. We followed each movie and all of the after credit scenes and pieced it together. Like the average Joe can be interested in that. Yeah. And uh, no, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, that's why if you, it's possible to have uh, a theory is what's coming next video or chat about Brandon Sanderson, also about a song of ice and fire. Um, a bit for Hob, I've definitely like engaged in speculation and like, what does this mean? And will this ghost here? And what we're going to see. Um, whereas with Abercrombie, like I've never ever wanted to do like a predictions like thing. Cause I'm just like, I don't know. It's going to be people being shitty and that'll, you know, resolve itself in whatever way Lord Grimdark sees. Like, it's not like well, that kind of thing. Well, yeah. And, and let's be honest because of the lack of kind of rounded out lore around the things, the speculation can only be so much. There's only so much to do. Well, there's also the fact that like, I'm fairly confident that it's not a thing that's being set up that will get answered. I will be very surprised if it does get answered. <laughs> yeah. I saw a lot of people have like really high hopes for some of, um, I mean, to keep it spoiler free, like maker type things uh, mm. to happen. And I was just like, that's not it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. It, it actually would be bad if it had because in fact, it's also not going to happen just because Joe Abercrombie himself is like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it means. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, if we picked one person out of all of them for world building, I think George is probably the 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 one that I would pick, um, though. I do think that the other two have really interesting strengths that are different than a lot of other places like Joe's world actually evolving over time instead of just sitting in a medieval uh, space is one of my favorite things in fantasy mm -hmm. and Hob her slow unveiling of magic throughout her series um, and still leaving it up to the reader to kind of get, figure things out is amazing. Uh, I really love it, but I do but think Martin... also I do think she and Martin kind of share like that, like the idea that like, this is where, again, like, if we're doing read alikes between the three, like, if the thing that you love is this, like, slow drip drab of, like, pieces of information about magic that are still nebulous and unclear and still makes the world feel, like, unknown. It's not like a, oh, this is, like, uh, it, yeah, okay, everyone knows that, like, I tend not to like Sanderson books. And, like, if you are the type of reader that likes a puzzle, because that's how it seems, like, it doesn't seem like a world that I'm learning about. It seems like, because you know he's going to tell you the answer and it'll be a big twist and there'll be this like big epic climax where like all of these pieces that he teased before are going to be clues that come together in like you know for Makes very good most puzzles. people satisfying way for me i'm just like oh, i hate puzzles so like i mean <laughs> that's what it feels like and if that's what you want is like find the pieces put it together here's the answer and like there's craft to that not to say there isn't I like that, like, Definitely. there are some pieces and I can think that maybe it'll get answered and some of it does get answered, but some of it's still unknown. Like, I love that. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I I like puzzles. Um, I, I like especially I, I like the Stormlight books, um, but I am definitely a little bit more in tuned with this type of fantasy. I actually like low fantasy. Like, I'm just a really big fan. I really like historical fiction. Uh, George definitely takes like inspiration from historical fiction which i really like and that's why he can write uh history books <laughs> about his series like i think people kind of undervalue how much work has been put into the world building well honestly uh, i mean when people talk about you know tolkien being like a watershed moment for fantasy and then george r martin being kind of the next watershed moment for fantasy and i think it's no accident that both of them like the kind of like just outside of the book world development that they both did like tolkien invented yeah. middle earth and was like i may as well tell some stories in this world that i Make invented language. a language for yeah. <laughs> you know like that was like the stories were like an afterthought and yeah. with george R. R. martin like it's like it's clear that like he has this intense well of like just just knowledge just for himself that like he has the history of this world and if he needs to he can draw on it but he doesn't need to find a reason to squeeze in every single thing he's figured out about his world into the book because he thought of it so some character is going to tell you about it at some point because he thought of it and you're like i have it i know the history of my world and if it comes up if it becomes relevant if i need to draw on that then there's this like well of like genuine history of the world to like bring into it yeah and i think that that is why 
uh, these three authors, especially George and, and Robin Hobb, um, they can take their time and breathe a little bit. And I like, I was, I say this all the time. It's, it's actually kind of the mock people and they don't realize it, but I say, I love boring books, you know? Yes. I, so I don't think, I don't think they're boring at all. Or like, uh, <laughs> when people talk about like meandering books. I'm like, as long as what you're doing is as, um, when I first read King Killer Chronicle, um, when like I was you know, the first, I was still reading name of the wind for the first time. I hadn't even finished it. And I was like, I knew this was an all time favorite because I was like, nothing has happened, but those are the best 50 pages of nothing that I've ever read. Yeah. And, and when we say nothing, things are actually like there are, there's a reason why the author wrote the words. It just might not be the biggest narrative thrust. Yeah. But like people... in an outline for plot events, nothing happened in like nothing moved forward in like right. those 50 pages in that sense. And so, but at the same time, like if you know what you're doing, like if you are interested in developing your characters in a way that makes them feel believable and developing your world in a way that makes it feel believable, you can't just have you can't like skip to the good part. <laughs> well, certainly. And, and who's to say that that character building for that 50 pages doesn't pay off in a huge narrative thrust in the final book or something like that? Also, character building is the thing that makes you care in those epic moments. Like you can't just write the epic moments because I don't care about a big war if I'm not already like super invested in the characters that are it, in the war. So like if you just yeah. skipped to the big battle, I'm like, that's why I hate when books do the cinema thing of opening on a battle sequence. And I'm like, ah, at least in a movie, it is visually impressive to see a chase sequence or a battle when I have no emotional stakes in this yet. But I'm like, well, that sure does look cool. So you have my attention. But in a book, I can't even look at anything. So I'm like, why? Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, like, and this is kind of a side tangent. This is why, like, I don't know if, like, breaking a book up and then discussing it in parts is actually all that productive. <laughs> because I see this all the time. It's with, pretty holistic with, if it's good. Yeah. So, for instance, let's take our Song of Ice and Fire reread, right? Uh, if we were all first timers, me, you, and Alex, and we get into a Game of Thrones and we do a live stream every. 12 chapters or something uh and you say yeah the first 12 chapters are good i mean it's a little slow like nothing's happening but like we know now finishing the book why all that stuff ends up paying off and why like the john aaron letter is such a big deal and maybe sometimes it's even like three or four books down the road whenever you're dealing with a big series um and it kind of like builds this interpersonal narrative that it's a boring book or it's meandering and it's like well no you just haven't got to the part where it matters yet um, so I, I like the way we did our read along much better than people coming together too early. And you're not biased. <laughs> well, of course not. But I, I actually think this. Uh, so we just did a read along on Alan's uh, discord that went very poorly. Um, not not like structured wise, but like people didn't like the book. Uh, yeah, Alan I, sucks. We hate Alan. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But the book and I do think the book has a ton of problems. But I think that people tuned in and people said Ugh, nothing happened in the first 30 chapters. And people just said. Yeah, nothing happened in the first 30 chapters, but maybe it pays off in book two. Maybe it pays off at the end. Like, why not come together at the end of the completed work and talk about the work as a whole? I guess that's what I'm trying to say is like, I think a lot of the meandering talk that comes, especially for like uh, Hob and Martin, is just the fact that people are not finishing the book. Like, you, I don't know. I think finishing the book is really important, personally. Well, that's what I mean. When people always give me grief for the fact that I don't DNF um and like i'm trying to do it more this year because like sometimes like i'm kind of you know, the writing is just bad and you're like yeah. there is there's no there's nothing's gonna save this i don't care if there's like a great ending because the prose is awful and i hate this and like that's not going to change so like why am i forcing myself to read this just to read it so like there are times when i'm like okay like i really should just dnf it because like there's no point to finishing this mm -hmm. but most of the time like i hate dnfing things because well one there's a lot to be learned from reading a bad book like even if uh, that is your end opinion like i don't i don't really ever feel or it's rare that i feel like i wasted my time reading it yeah. because like i learned something about writing craft i learned something about myself as a reader i learned something about you know how what not to write like and about like what i need to be wary of like when i go now i know something about like to avoid when i see that in other books i'm like ah that's gonna be like that i shouldn't pick that up so i just yeah to, to and and sometimes it does have like a brilliant ending that doesn't necessarily save a book because it's valid to say I shouldn't have had to slog to get here. 
Yeah, um, sometimes it doesn't feel yeah. like it's a justified payoff. But I think there's also a bigger problem is like people will say things. Actually, uh, Matt said, was that Age of Ash? That wasn't. That was um, Brian Stavely's first book that wasn't very good. Um, nice guy, though. But um, no, actually, Abraham's a really good example because Abraham has book ones that are really slow and everyone always hates his book one. And the problem with this is then they read book two, book three, book four, and they never reconsider book one. But if you do take the time to reconsider, you go, oh, that wasn't a slog. That was the foundation. Oh, that made all this make sense. And it's just like that attitude. You know what I'm saying? Like whenever you start reading a book and you check in halfway with everyone doing the read along and you say, it's boring, but you don't reassess it at the end and think, well, all right, so was it boring or did I miss something? And I'm not always saying blame the reader. I mean, some books are just not, <laughs> not that interesting. And I'm with you. I don't DNF very much. I'm trying to do a little bit more because I think I have my taste pretty ironed out, but I'll give mostly anything the full opportunity to impress me. I mean, well, I, I, I also just goals. hate having to qualify every statement with like, maybe by the end, uh -huh. maybe at the end, mm -hmm. maybe later. Like, I don't want to have to say that. I, I read the whole thing and it was terrible, but it never got fixed and it was awful. <laughs> like, I don't want to have to uh, leave that asterisk all the time. So there's another reason why as yeah. a reviewer, I don't DNF. Um, if I also, if I DNF something, I don't, I don't even, I usually don't talk about it. I mean, I might say, Hey, I DNF this, but like, I don't leave like a rating on Goodreads for it. Yeah. Usually. It was just like, that was another reason I was never DNFing. Cause I'm like, I spent time on this. And I want it to count. <laughs> so yeah. um, was my new rule for myself this year is like, I will DNF something or like, I will still allow myself to rate it if I got to 75% or later. And I was just like, this is not getting better yeah. and it's not going to get better. And I can rate this. Um, I guess all I this... haven't done that yet this year, but I've given myself permission to. I think all this is to say that we don't find these books meandering um, at all. And I, and I know uh, we talked about a feast for crows already, but a feast for crows is notorious for being everyone's least favorite book. And we both said it's pretty, pretty awesome yeah. this time around. <laughs> and again, I mean, expectations is also a big part sure. of what affects your either because like a previous book in the series was action packed and the next one isn't, which is the case with Beast for Crows, um, or because a series is hyped. So like people hype at this point, like even though uh, a first time reader of First Law um, when it first came out wouldn't have had hype to go off of or like knowledge of where that ends to go off of, um, you might have heard good things about it. So you go into it and being like, ah, where is this going? But now First Law gets hyped. So you go into it and you've heard this series is, is like people's all time favorites. <laughs> um, and you're like, it's going to be great. And then like you read the lady itself and you're like, I mean, it wasn't bad, but like, where this is happens, this going? <laughs> this happens in waves, right? Um, this book is the best thing since sliced bread. People read it with massive expectations. I, and I think this happens to Song of Ice and Fire a ton because of just how polarizing it is. And then the next phase is actually, it's not, it's actually not that good. Um, it's actually really boring. And it's just, it's silly. Uh, mi mismanaged expectations is like a huge thing. That and mood. And I mean, it's it makes sense if like, it's not a spiteful thing with a song of my spite. It's just simply, it was overhyped. That like, it has so, it's been this pillar that everyone's mm. like, these are so good that like people are like, okay, it was, it was good, but it wasn't the best thing since sliced bread. Like, because your expectations were sky high, which is like why... I feel like a broken record that every time I talk about Abercrombie, I'm like, I mean, when I first read The Blade itself, I gave it three stars and I was like, why the heck would anybody want to read this? And I later changed my mind. Like, I'm always like, and you know, if you don't like certain things, it won't be for you. And like, this is what it is going into it. You should know to expect this. If you're not expecting that, then you won't like it. Like, yeah. I'm not like, it's brilliant. Just, I mean, I sometimes say that, but like by then I hope I'm <laughs> with people who like, who know, I've heard me talk about it enough. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I definitely think that these three authors are, I wish there were more people like them, <laughs> which some people might not love. Um, but yeah, I, I wish we had a little bit more of this. Unfortunately, though, I do think that the genre is going away from these styles. Uh, and I don't mean grimdark or, or whatever, like any of that stuff. I, I mean, just the approach to writing um, seems like it's moving more into the fantastical. And that doesn't mean these kind of books won't be published. Um but, you know, new age writers looking up at what's trending. What is the trend? What are publishers looking for? I don't know if they're looking for the next Robin Hobb or George Martin anymore. Maybe probably George Martin because he sells so much still. But I mean, uh, pretty every I'm sure every new book I've picked up is the next Game of Thrones. <laughs> I've been assured. For sure. For <laughs> sure. Um, 
I definitely think like with Hob and Martin being a little bit longer um, winded. Right. I, I, but I mean, we do. I mean, we do still have. I mean, well, I guess this is also why they are the exception, not the rule and why they are the greats, because like there are hundreds of thousands of books being published and they are not all names that go on your top favorites, iconic modern day classics. I mean, they are all just it's not even that publishers are not interested in this. Like they are not a dime a dozen like it's not that like oh every author should just like try to be more like abercrombie like i'm sorry like they don't have it in them (laughs) to be like abercrombie yeah so like they are talented and that is hard to find no matter how you know many books you're publishing yeah and the whole next game of thrones thing is like just an indicator of how much people i believe have missed the merits of that work uh, and have boiled it down to very um, reductive points. Like, so it's stabby. Cool. Everyone dies. Ugh. And it's like, I've actually heard people say, it's like, that's all he did. And that's what people like it, which if that's true, like, I don't know what books you read. And I assume that you um, struggle. Yeah, there may be people that function. that is literally the only reason they liked it. So sure. <laughs> there are, that exists. Cool. The same as like people who think that Abercrombie is just like so grim and bloody. And that's so metal. And I'm like, that's, he is laughing at you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I, I am think... very glad to see that. Because of the three, if we're talking about like, is this marketable? Is this what publishers want? I think of the three, the one that is the least sexy is Robin Hobb. Is because like, it doesn't, like, it's not purporting to be. And it isn't like, at all edgy. So like, even yeah. though like, we laugh at how much the like, edginess is like, pushed for like, the promo of Abercrombie or George R. Martin. Because they are both so much more than that and so much less than that. Like that is not what they are wholly about. Yes. Like they are grim dark and yes, there is violence, but like that is not the thing that makes them what they are. Um, but like Robin Hobb is like, okay, so what if you had like the types of storytelling the two of them have, and you don't even have the like sexy edginess to go <laughs> be like, but it's like so edgy. Like you can't even do that with a Hobb. So. Yeah. Yeah. Hobb is uh, so, um, so genuine in her approach uh and she's I very- say, of the three there's a, a sincerity to her writing that i like i don't want to make it sound like there's some from the false soul. or disingenuous the other two but like no. hob is very sincere yeah from the soul um no one no one else could have ever finished her work like there's just no way it, it's so much her and yeah <sighs> i can't say any spoilers <laughs> but I believe that these characters have really lived in her heart for a very long time. And she's my favorite writer as far as characters go, actually. Um, I think there's people who do certain things better or, you know, could be comparable. But for me and the development of the characters over a large amount of time, uh, I don't know if there's anyone better at character development than her. And if I had to pick like a best writer, she'd probably be my best writer of all time, regardless of genre. Um, doesn't mean she's necessarily my number one or anything like that, but uh, I mean, she's definitely top five, but I think I think she's the most talented writer. She's the best of all time, but she's not my number one. <laughs> well, you, know, you know what I mean, though? Like you can acknowledge, yeah, know. you know, there, there's biases and things like this because George will probably always be my favorite writer um, because. Well, of and I mean, the the main reason that Robin Hobb should could never and should never be shelved in Grimdark is that it is like it is entirely lacking in cynicism and and First Law is like composed of cynicism and George R. R. Martin is quite cynical. So it is that lack of cynicism that like no matter how dark it gets, no matter how violent it gets, no matter how brutal it gets, it's never cynical. Yeah, it's and in uh, that's not to say some awful things don't happen, especially yeah. early and then even more so later. Um, but it's still I never think, oh, is this grim dark? I'm just like, no, this is just dark. And sometimes it's grim, but it's not grim dark. <laughs> no, uh, th- there's a sense of hope at the end of it all. And it's interesting what points you will draw from the lives that are lived in Robin Hobbs series. If there it's a slice of life, but it's also like a slice of you because she hits on things that are very personal that you don't think about until they happen to you. But as they happen to Fitz and other characters, um, I think you get a preview of how you're going to handle that situation in your life. And it's all very human and low to the ground. And, um, why well, I mean me and Mara last night like I mean obviously I couldn't help myself and I brought up Abercrombie and George R. R. Martin because that's the whole reason this is happening this conversation is because we keep doing that but um uh we also like I didn't expect to do that but we a lot compared Hobb to Dickens 
Um, and it is quite Dickensian high fantasy. I, I've actually heard that before as well. Yeah. You heard, heard it from me first, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think I heard it at the conference. I was just at someone, someone was talking about how she, she reminded them of Dickens. Cause I mean like Fitz and his like childhood of like trauma and growing up with more trauma and having adults around him cause further trauma. <laughs> it's very like David Copperfield. Um, great expectations it's just you know what yeah. if there were also dragons <laughs> <laughs> um also hob has the best dragons in my opinion that like ever i think um yeah uh, curran uh curran uh, asking Derry, uh kind of like well, how does she compare robin hob uh to joe abercrombie and george r, r. martin um i think she is of the george flavor of being a little bit longer winded while still being able to use really economical sentences and prose to get the Abercrombie feel at times. Uh, she's also very raw and gritty while being somehow poetic in the way that she somehow states things. Uh, there are times where you'll read a sentence from Robin Hobb and you'll say there's literally no other way to describe what she just described. She she figures it out and it's really impressive. But when I say it's like a song of ice fire, people think it's going to be this massive amazing world building and, and this big political intrigue from the get go. No, it is very much you experiencing life in this land with a character. It's much more slice of life. It's first person. Um, and it's outstanding. Well, I feel like I can say, so for all three, um, like, well, it's three different things. Like what I think when I read their prose for George R. R. Martin, I'll read something and go, boy, is that interesting for Abercrombie? I'll read something and go, boy, is that clever? Hmm. And for Robin Hobb, I'll think, boy, is that true? Wow! And yeah, like that's that could be that could sum up this whole thing. Honestly, that that's all right. Really, good night. <laughs> that's honestly that's a very elegant way to putting it. Yeah, Thank you. that's right. So you hadn't heard that before. No, I have not heard okay. that before. The Dickens thing. Go. You should. <laughs> <laughs> You're just brewing. That son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, I, 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 yeah, I like that quite a bit, and I think um, they each all they all have their own strengths, and I don't think any of their weaknesses are. Um, can't, I, if to me it doesn't ruin anything about them um, like I could probably point out a weakness of each of the three but it, it's so minute it's not even worth considering to me um, I would read anything any of these authors make you know I mean I have like quoted this to death and I even bought a bookmark of it because I saw it and I was like well I quote that all the dang time so I, I gotta get this bookmark but in King Killer Chronicle Patrick Rothfuss says to love something because is easy. That's uh, like putting a penny in your pocket. But to love something despite. To know the flaws and love them too. That is rare and pure and perfect. Yeah, let's go. You should read King Killer Chronicle. <laughs> I am. I'm reading it. This, I think I'm reading it in the fall. Uh, but I'm I reading this this year 100%. Uh, 100%. You know what's weird about this though? Is we're talking. That you haven't read King Killer Chronicle? I don't know, Jimmy. A lot certainly. is weird about that. <laughs> But, you know, we we aren't really talking about the other works that these authors have done. So obviously, um, Robin Hobb has authored underneath a different name. She's also did the Soldier Son trilogy uh, as Robin Hobb. George has written a vast amount of sci fi. He also read a uh, wrote a vampire horror novel, which I loved. Uh, and then Abercrombie has his YA Viking series. Um, have you read any of the extended works from these people? I call them extended works. They're just other works. You know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, I've read everything Abercrombie's ever written. So yes to that. Oh, uh, I have not read. I mean, I've barely read the first six books in the realm of the elderlings for Hobbes. So I have not even finished that. And I think for George R. R. Martin, I started reading something with like an eclipse looking thing on the cover. And like, I like accidentally DNF'd it. Like I wasn't a booktuber or anything at the time. I just like randomly picked it up and I meant, meant it light? to be. Yes. And I meant it to be like a commute book or something. And I just kept like not reading it when I was on the bus and then forgetting about it. And then just, I just never read it, but not because like I hated it or something. Yeah. I'm i uh, I'm going to be, di I've read fever dream by George. Um, and I read ice dragon, which is like a short children's story. I actually really like that uh, book a lot. And I'm going to read his tough voyaging, uh, dying of the light. He also read a thing. I think it's called like hunter's game and it's like co-authored by, uh, a couple of different others, but Daniel Abraham helped him write it. And it's like, um, like a thriller or something like really strange. Um, so I'm going to read more of his works and I'm actually excited to see like his other stuff, you know, cause he's obviously going to write it very differently. Like Tad Williams wrote memory of Sauron Thorn and his prose is very Tolkien ass, beautiful writing really. But I, then I read his 
War of the Flowers standalone and his prose was totally different as it should be. Um, I mean, that's the thing of like, uh, I mean, not just these authors, but like authors in general that you like, if you like them from a certain book or series and then to see it, can they do something different or are they just like a one trick pony that's like really, really good at this and nothing else. <laughs> yeah so like and obviously so i didn't tell pierce brown this this wasn't a thing i share but i thought it when i picked up the new books um because everything he had written so far was darrow's perspective and like yes we're still in the red rising world so like i guess still one trick pony but like for all i know darrow is pierce brown that's the only voice i've ever mm -hmm. heard the only perspective i've heard so like i don't know that you can write differently from this this is just you maybe maybe i don't know you've never written anybody else's perspective so then, I mean, obviously I told him I loved seeing Darrow through someone else's eyes, but I loved seeing him writing from someone else's eyes, multiple different eyes. And they did all feel like distinct different characters. So I was like, maybe Darrow is you, because maybe that is where you started. I don't, I still don't know that. But like, I do know that you can write people that are not Darrow and that are definitely not Darrow. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting and sometimes also makes you sad to see them like step out of like what you know them for especially these these being big series um the one thing i will say about george who's the only author i've actually read outside of their main series um of these three uh i thought fever dream had a lot of the same strength as a song of ice and fire while being completely different it had a lot of atmosphere and since it was written in our world he tapped into history and made it come alive uh and in some ways it was super hard to read because it was written in the 1800s in the south which you can imagine that being you know not fun in america um but you know very accurate while still being really cool because it's about vampires on steamboats pretty cool very accurate to the times yeah yeah as, as we know as yes. history tells us there were vampires on tugboats for sure uh, <laughs> but um yeah i'm excited i, I want to read a uh, you know obviously uh, megan lindholm uh, aka robin hobb uh i want to read more of her stuff and uh, and I want to read Chattered Sea by Abercrombie. Did you always know that Robin Hobb was a female? Because I definitely thought she was a guy when I first saw her books. So I have an uh, an aunt named Robin. So I actually assumed. But everyone I've ever recommended her to always goes, oh, what does he write? Every single time. Every single time. Yep. Because, you know, the only way you can tell usually that it's a female is if it's initials. It's, def it's definitely not initials. So it must be a guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, George Railroad Martin. He has an issue. You know what I mean, though. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, F Shattered Sea isn't um, bad. I just feel very disappointed in it. Because, <laughs> oh, no. I mean, like, as compared, like, that's the thing. Oh, just like talking about rating systems, like, it's really hard to use a rating system. Because, like, if I compare Shattered Sea to a lot of other books, I'd be like, well, it's better than that. Um and it might even a book that I gave four stars to, but I know Abercrombie is capable of better than this. So reading Shattered Sea, I'm like, mm, that's not quite up to snuff for you, sir. So, Meh. yeah, yeah. Well, you do you do come to it, and that's why, uh, as my friend Scott, the bald booktuber, always says, publication order is a must for authors. Like yeah. if you're going to dive in. So I read uh, Guy Gabriel K's Lines of Alberson, really enjoyed it. Uh, I'd be curious to see what you think of that, actually, um, but. Now everyone's like telling me, oh, don't read Finnevar Tapestry. Now you read that because that's his first trilogy. And you're like, hey, it's too it's too um, derivative of Tolkien, all this stuff. I'm like, well, now I'm going to read it. And now I'm just going to stick to pub order. Like I should have done pub order. And if you had done pub order on Jeff Crombie, you would have got Shattered Sea first, right? No, he took a break from first lot to write Shattered Sea. Did he? I, I was. Which at, is I, why, like, when I was trying oh, to like. It's actually very disappointing. Trying to figure out. Yeah. But so then I was trying to figure out why it's so different. Hmm. And I mean there's many reasons and maybe none of them are the reason. And maybe it's literally that it's brilliant and only I don't think it cause I'm dumb. Who knows? But like um, he did say he felt really burnt out when he was writing red country. And I feel like I could feel that, but I feel like it's in keeping with a Western style anyway. So I don't think that hurts the book, but I get like, I'm like, I feel that. Um, and then he, after red country was like, I need a break. And so yeah. he wrote shattered sea and then he came back to first law. Um, but shattered sea i mean there's a lot of things that are, so it's ya it's not adult he feels burnt out already so he's trying something different and so like i don't know if it's because he was burnt out i don't know if it's because either he thought or someone told him that ya has to be simple and stripped back so he was like okay i can't do anything too interesting because it's ya yeah. um, or if he was just like pooped <laughs> or like what because like shattered sea <laughs> like on paper like the ideas at play the political situation at play the world he's built for it or like in concept what it's like i think it sounds 
brilliant. And I, I do think it is brilliant. It's just that like, he never seasoned it. He didn't like make it interesting. Like he never filled it in with like the interesting meaty Abercrombie stuff. I was like, why is this not interesting to me? Because like, I know what you wrote and I know what situation you're describing to me. And that should be so like filled with like nuance. And I'm just like, not getting that. Why am yeah. I not getting that? <laughs> Yeah, that would be very frustrating. I'm I'm very curious to to read it. Um, because I do think I've read about the premise and I thought the premise sounds very interesting. The fact that it's YA, a little disconcerting for me because I'm not a uh, YA reader. But again, that's means, where I'm but... like, if uh if either he thought this or someone told it to him that you can't make it interesting because it's YA. I mean, not that they would phrase it that way, but that would be like the you know, thinking. I'd be pissed because like I've read YA that goes very dark places and does very interesting things. So like if that's what he thought was that like uh, I can't make it too interesting because it's YA. I'd be like, you can't. Like, you, you can't write it like just like First Law, no. But like, you could do a lot more than what you did. Yeah. So, does that make you nervous for his new work that isn't First Law related? Well, it won't be YA. So, if that well, was the it. thing that made Shattered see the way it was, but like, I mean, just in general, it, like his his only non First Law was like, eh, I would say like the thing that makes me nervous about it is how annoyed he seems with it because <laughs> yeah, he's, he's like his own worst hype man and like even when he talked to me in the interview about it he was very like oh, it's kind of this thing that's like like he didn't seem enthused and then i saw um there was some i don't know who posted it um but like some like question or prompt on twitter that he was responding to and it was something like you know if you could see like any book written by any author or like the, the you know whatever pairing like you would like to see x author tackle x thing or something like that like who would it be or what would it be and abercrombie responded mine because they would mean it was done <laughs> and i was just like <laughs> um funny but i'm nervous <laughs> yeah and you can it's hard to tell because he's that's just kind of how he he's is he's very self-deprecating but yeah. i'm just like uh how's it going <laughs> do, do you hope that it's it's a bit bigger in scope well it's going to be the opposite of first law in terms of magic because it's going to be lots and lots of magic which might do, be why he's struggling with it do we know if it's a standalone i i feel like it's a standalone i think it's isn't it isn't like i think i'm trying to remember because i think i asked him that um and i think he basically said that it's it would be like a dresden type thing where like he's created a world okay. and he's created like characters that like this book like the story is done but it's a thing that like could be a going. recurring episodic thing that you could write more. Oh, I could see him being very good at that because he likes the noir type style of narrative. Yeah, I mean that's what he that's why he structured the first law the way that he did because he was interested in tell, using like noir storytelling yeah. where you don't know what things are and you start in weird places. Well, so yeah, and, it's a totally different narrative structure. Yeah, yeah. That, that's why he was like it didn't super work at a trilogy. Like, admittedly, that's why people <laughs> are like, where is this going? Because I was like, what if I just start random places and don't explain it? And people are like. What does this mean? You're like, well, you have to read all three books. Duh. Right. <laughs> so right. he's like, okay, so like my bad on that. <laughs> like that's where he was thinking. Hmm. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious to see his new work. I hope that I'm glad that it's actually opposite of First Law. Not because like love magic or anything, but that way, even if a lot of the charm comes through, <laughs> uh, it'll at least have a different feeling. Um, well, I also, it. I don't think that he's done with First Law. And if he like felt, you know, burnt out, did Shattered Sea and was like, huh, but then he came back roaring with like refreshed creative well to write Age of Madness. OK, then write your like big magic, like mystery thriller ex action book. And maybe it's good. Maybe it's not. But you'll be nice and refreshed <laughs> to come back to First Law. Yeah, because there's still a lot of tales to tell uh, in that world for sure. Is um Hob working on anything? So apparently Hob, I believe, was working on um, a novella. I think Scott actually told me this. And there had been rumors that it would have been two characters that are in the series that I can't say, just to be careful. Um, but they'd be from the Realm of the Elderlings. Yes, they're from Realm of the Elderlings, and that it would have been something along the lines of a pandemic or a plague or something. And she decided to scrap it because of the world situation. Obvious reasons. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, uh, other than that, I'm not sure. I know she did write something as Megan Lindholm, but I don't know if... I don't think there's anything on the horizon for Realm of the Elderlings. Um, maybe as Robin Hobb is something else. Maybe that would be cool. 
Uh, I would say never say never. But her last forward in the last book of Roman Dudling seemed like the ending of an era to me. It made me tear up. For Realm of the Elderlings or for her as a fantasy writer? For Realm of the Elderlings. For Realm. Because I mean, like, I wouldn't necessarily expect to hear that she's working on more Realm of the Elderlings, um, especially since I hear so much about how the end of it is kind of conclusive for all of the preceding mm. trilogies, that it kind of wraps mm. it together. And, like, that's not true of First Law. It's not like a the end of Age of Madness was like, and this gives yeah, you the answers yeah. for, I mean, First Law is very much of like, we might come back. We might come back. Stuff happened. We might come back. Like, yeah, it's not as far as her working on something new as as Robin Hobb. I have, I think she'll just continue to write underneath Megan Lindholm, which she is still, you know, speculative fiction. Um, so yeah, you certainly wouldn't expect her to endeavor on something as ambitious as the realm of the elderlings for a different new world series. I mean, I'd, I'd welcome it. <laughs> I'd yeah, be so like, excited. The time and investment in like another yeah. 16 book arc. Yeah. And I, I mean, emotionally the way she writes, I have to imagine it takes a lot out of her. So, yeah. Um, as far as new things for George, he's releasing a history of dragons coffee table book. That looks cool, but not, you know, obviously it's not the books we want, but, um, <laughs> I'll buy the opposite it. of what I wanted. Yeah, so I will <laughs> buy it and I'll read it and I'll think it'll be cool. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe we'll get some. I will say this in his newest update. He did mention that he wants to or is writing new Duncan Egg stories, which is for me good because I love Duncan Egg. Um, and George is really good at short fiction. It's a uh, he wrote a lot of short fiction. I was going to say it's a shocking thing to say when you look at Dance of the Dragons. Like, he's so good worse at, I was like, is he? <laughs> right. No, you're you're 100 percent right. But if you look at his sci-fi stuff, you know he wrote a lot of short stuff. And Duncan Egg, uh, we're, we'll be discussing that uh, what in a week, one week actually on the dot on my channel, uh, and we'll go over it then. But I think it's really solid, uh, really solid stuff. And I think he even shines a little bit more in some areas not all but in some areas in his short form writing so well it does also like it forces you to be more disciplined yeah you're right because you can't you, just be like Wah! you have to get there <laughs> you have to get there and you got to pack a lot of punch in every single sentence um which george is pretty good at because his sentences sometimes have two three four meanings and foreshadowing all in one so be cool yeah i'd heard this too that she has bad arthritis yeah which is really sad because I have rheumatoid and I get it. Especially also because like if a writer stops writing because like they don't feel like they have stories to tell is different from like I have so many stories that I physically can't get out, you know? Yeah. That's I mean, not that either is great, but yeah. I enjoy hearing Jimmy say Dunkin' Egg. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does sound very silly. When you're like, Dunkin I love Egg is Dunkin' awesome. Egg and you're like, is that like Have you started it? I'm, I'm about to start it uh, probably tomorrow. I finished it, but I st I did it very early in the month, so like okay. I think I'm gonna skim it, but again before we. Did you do the audio? Yeah. Dude, how good's the audio? It's good, but he murmurs a lot and kind I, of like. I, well, mumbles. I do too. So yeah, I, but I, so for an audiobook that you speed up, I was like, oh my god, you're murmuring. What did what what did you just say? <laughs> was that Blood Raven? So like Roy talks very slowly, like an old Shakespearean actor. So Listen. you can speed that the fuck up. Listen. Listen. <laughs> all right, let's leave old Roy out of this. All right, <laughs> he's suffered enough. Let him re let him rest in peace. Um, did Hob um always kind of intend this epic huge maybe not specifically 16 books but like this big arc you know i don't know actually that's a really good question i'm not you're sure. the expert i expected you to know dairy in the chat is the expert dairy is the hob definitely the smartest hob fan i know um i actually don't know that though um i think probably like all no way you know what maybe not for abercrombie I was going to say, all of these authors, maybe the story grew on them as they went. George, the worst of the culprits. But I don't know if Abercrombie did or not. Well, I mean, Abercrombie writes his trilogies in one go. And then it was like, yeah. I'll do a standalone. Yeah. I'll do another yeah. standalone. And that's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> is it like one of these things where it's like, well, what else am I going to write? You know, I'll but I mean, write because you. like, again, I don't know what it's like, but it, from how it sounds at the end of the last trilogy, like conclusively like ties in th like threads that are set up from the very beginning. So it feels like you would have to have like from the beginning kind of figured out where you're planting these seeds along the way that will at the end of, you know, maybe she thought it'd be 12. Maybe she thought it'd be, you know, maybe not necessarily specifically 16 books, but that mm -hmm. you'd have like a, 
I will, at the end of many books, finally pay off what I've set up in the first book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Derry is saying, yeah, it was a trilogy that grew. Fool was supposed to be a walk-on character that vanished after one scene. You want to talk about a character that jumps off the page. That's awesome. Well, I think uh, I might have already told you this when um, you had me on to talk about Age of Madness. Um, but and this is not spoilers, it's just like a character in it. But um, Clover was the last character that he added. Like he wasn't even he had written the whole trilogy and it hadn't didn't have that perspective. <laughs> yeah, and after like, you told me that, I was like, you know what? That kind of makes sense. But also, I feel like it is a lot better for having that in there. Like trying oh. to imagine what the story would be like without that. I'm like, yeah, I needed that. <laughs> I would agree. I would definitely agree. She said she always knew how it would end, but was surprised by how many books it took. Hmm. Uh, Matt said, I'd be so scared losing my audience if I left the universe. I think a lot of authors feel this way. Well, I mean, it does take um, discipline both on the part of the author and on or discipline and patience from the author and the publisher and the reading public. So like the it's putting a lot of faith in the author that they will pay this off and that readers will be interested enough to keep reading it and that they will, they do have a plan in mind that they will actually write it and we won't be in a winds of winter situation. So yeah. like publishers want to know that like, okay, you're going to, if you're going to write 16 books, we want to know readers are going to buy them and that you really will write these 16 books. We're not going to be like, you know? yeah. And I think that the outlines are probably in demand. I mean, even George had an outline at the beginning for the tr first trilogy, what it was supposed to be three books which my God, that outline is wild. <laughs> you go read it back. It's insane. <laughs> I, I do appreciate that Abercrombie writes all of his books at once though. I really do. Well, for a trilogy, I mean, a standalone yeah, doesn't right, right. matter, but yeah. Well, I think it also, um, I mean, I was six, writing 16 books at once and then publishing them like, uh, if you can, great. But like, I wouldn't expect that. But I think if it is as short as a duology or a trilogy, it does it benefits the story not just because like okay we know you've done it we're not waiting for you to publish it because mm -hmm. if you've written your trilogy then like you might have had in mind to be setting up certain things but as the story organically does shift a bit then you can once you finish the trilogy your first draft can be like okay no i did set these up a bit but like the way it actually went down is a little bit different or like i want to emphasize it a bit more you can really go back and like plant those seeds properly so that by the time yeah. so that it does feel like this cohesive whole instead yeah. of like i originally planned this and that's why this doesn't end up going anywhere because i wrote that and then later changed my mind <laughs> like if you've written it at once you can fix that yeah and the way george gets around and he says this he leaves things open for interpretation but he also leaves it open for himself <laughs> um you know the famous is Tyrion a targaryen there's a reason why the breadcrumbs are there it's because at probably at one point he was considering it uh, I don't think it's going to be the case now. But. And it's possible that the first draft of an Abercrombie trilogy has a bunch of open ended things where he's like, I think I want to tease this. I think I want to tease this. I think yeah. I want to tease that. And then he finishes it and is like, so and I ended up ending it here. OK, so let's go back and erase the teases that went nowhere and like emphasize the teases that actually added up to something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Kieran asked, uh, was it supposed to end with the dream of spring? No, it was uh, it was always supposed to be it was only supposed to be three books and it would have been a, it would have been Game of Thrones, Clash and Storm of Swords. But the ending points were vastly different. It isn't like he is still telling that same story. I mean, we're talking crazy differences um, that some are disturbing. <laughs> uh, there's also a title. Wait, when in... you say disturbing, do you mean like because it was going to be really like a fucked up storyline or uh, yeah i mean i could say it i guess it's not a spoiler since it doesn't happen it, yeah uh john and aria were supposed to end oh you together. yeah you told me that uh and if you go read book one you can tell he was laying those lines we read it now as brotherly and sisterly like, love, oh, oh so cute <laughs> but it's actually incest love uh was the in first intended draft so that is uh, a little disturbing uh another thing that's really interesting in the game of thrones is that uh jamie lannister is given the title of warden of the west and that is actually no longer a it, it's a there's a position because they mentioned it with a uh, sweet little Robin uh, that he is the warden or whatever. But George had to add that in because he completely abandoned this warden storyline for Jamie, where he would eventually end up on the throne. Uh, and that that never happened and never will. So uh, is Hob really good cool. for taking a break from Grimdark? No. If you don't want to be sad, I was gonna say, well, or it depends. Like, if you want something that has sincerity and 
that, then I guess, like, if you're sick of cynicism, maybe. But, like, generally, no. <laughs> yeah. Generally, no. Or, so, I was going to say, like, uh, I don't, I didn't think it was possible for Abercrombie to make me cry just because of how cynical everything is all the time. That, like, I mean, I, I feel feelings, obviously. I wouldn't read those books so many times. Oh, I, I, didn't. I cried in first law. I cried in Age of Madness only for the first time. No, I cried in uh, the original trilogy. Hit me hard. Can't. <laughs> I mean, I get like I feel feelings absolutely, and you know, sad feelings and hopeful feelings, like for sure. But I just I didn't think that again because it's so cynical that like because Robin Hobb is like hits you in the heart and then like twists the knife. So like it's like you're a monster if you don't feel upset <laughs> by what's going on in a particularly far seer. Um, whereas like Abercrombie is always like something horrible happens, but you're just like. Well, that's just how the world be, isn't it? Like that's yeah. like the vibe. You're just like, I can't be sad about that. Of course they died. Of course this didn't go well. Uh, I as would supposed to like, oh no. I I would honestly say that the last trilogy in Realm of the Elderlings could be considered borderline grimdark. I someone said that in chat last night. It's, and I was like, it's heavy. Very, <laughs> yeah, it's combine I mean, the heartbreak with violence. Oh god. <laughs> the final book is probably my second favorite book of all time. Uh, it's so storm of swords and then yeah uh, assassin's fate assassin's fate assassin's fate the bone hunters is somewhere in the in assassin's there. fate is the prettiest of the uk paperbacks oh they're beautiful it's very pretty that last trilogy is all like kind of shiny and just yeah pretty. i like it i like it it's shiny because it's, nice. <laughs> it's still i like that it's in keeping still like it looks like a cohesive series those editions mm -hmm. and yet that one is just like but we're the special ones so we're kind of sparkly <laughs> yeah i have them on the second shelf and i just absolutely adore just the way they look they're so is nice. that lord of the rings at the end yeah, I have I those know. Ah, that was yeah. that's impressive. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I think they might be with my Hobbs as well because they are the same size. Yeah, they're the same size. No, no, I give you, there's no way you can see from here, but that <laughs> that is Lord of the Rings. And that's Hob. <laughs> I mean, I think they go well together. They're like the same shape and size. There is like, you know what? I know we're not talking about Tolkien, but and Hob is not derivative of all Tolkien, in my opinion, but not, or like not any more than just like fantasy itself how he like yes. sort of like set the like and there might be some tropes is. like there could be tropes that cross over but it's not derivative um however tolkien has like a little bit of that like magic you know what i'm saying like where you're walking through the shire and it's like magical like when i get that same type of feeling when i'm walking like through buck with fits like I don't know what it is, and I, I I don't think I can quantify what I think. Well, I mean, uh, of the three, I feel like, well, this might go with sincerity, but, like, it feels the most, like, a genuine just fantasy story, as opposed to, like, the other two feel like commentaries on fantasy genre. Yeah. And yeah. that's, I mean, it does go with the sincerity thing. No, I no, I think it, you're yeah. right. Yeah, I think you're right. It's just interesting, because Hob doesn't have the brand new language that's actually mapped out in the summer really or all you know all these things oh, so lazy <laughs> <laughs> where's my language <laughs> but it, it's it's her approach to um it's kind of just the approach to the tone of, mm -hmm. of, of the work i guess is is maybe it oh, also i mean like when you start because like mara and i were talking about like which one i think she said that like you know because could you start with live ship should you start with farsi or can you start with whatever um Publicate and she was saying how like you know we both agree that like ideally you start with farseer but you know for somebody who's like put off by farseer then like we'll read live ship if you must first like that's better than nothing um but so mara was saying so because like the live ship feels more like a typical fantasy book in that way where like it might appeal to the general audience more because mm -hmm. it's like multiple perspectives in action and i was like okay I mean, yes, but also like what is more traditionally like a fantasy book than this young protagonist who's like at or going to or near a castle who's like, you know, discovering their life journey, destiny, chosen one, magic things like the Fitz story is like so traditional fantasy. Yeah, I I think it depends on the reader's prior experiences with fantasy. That That's very important. I mean, I think you go publication, not that you're asking me, but I would go publication order. Um, now, the in, <laughs> an interesting question is, which one do I like more? So I, I, my heart is with Farseer, but I think that Live Ships is a better trilogy. And that's, um, I mean, that's kind of how I felt about it. Mara definitely says that she likes Live Ships better. And I'm like, I, I think Live Ships is brilliant, but like nothing in Live Ship because 
I mean, no matter how the character work is amazing in it, but it can never compare to spending that amount of time with Fitz. Like it just, it doesn't have the page. It's yeah, like, it can't. They're accomplishing so, totally different things. Um, yeah. But so for that reason, like I never felt no matter how good it was, no matter how deep it was, no matter how connected to the characters I felt, it didn't matter because nothing could compare to how deeply connected yes. you feel to Fitz and how much that like emotionally like gets under your skin. Nothing yeah. in Live Ships can compete with that. Yeah, I actually I, I would agree with that. I in the end of Royal Assassins, like one of my favorite endings to any book ever. Um, and and it, it's funny because it includes a bias I have that I don't usually like, and it smashes my biases. And Robin Hobbs smashed a lot of my biases throughout those books. Um, and again, I again, like all three authors are that. for various reasons in various places doing things that somebody somewhere said you should never do. Yeah. And they're all just like, ha ha, hold my beer. <laughs> and, and, and also do things that are very commonplace in fantasy and fiction and don't do very well. Uh, I would say Hobbes romance is phenomenal. I would say that Abercrombie's romance is phenomenal, even though people might say what I actually think, I think Abercrombie writes extraordinarily good romance. In Which a I think way. Is like part and parcel of character work because you can't do good character yes. work and ignore love, which is something that humans experience. <laughs> yes, I I think Martin's weakest uh, aspect is actually his romance. Um, personally, uh, there's worse, um, but especially when it comes to his romantic scenes, uh, we've talked about it at length. But there's a lot of voyeurism. Feel a little voyeuristic. That. Voyeuristic and uh, actually missed opportunities because he could have used it to further the characters a little bit more, but it became a general thing, unfortunately. And he does sometimes, like we talked about again. Like there are certain characters where he does use it to further the character, but like. Sometimes not. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times it sounds like George, uh, and it doesn't sound like the character. Um, Hobbes' romance is amazing, and then Abercrombie uses the word squelch, so he wins. Yes, so much squelching. But I mean, Abercrombie went, like went off on like a little tirade um, about people turning their nose up at the idea of like sex and romance in books, and he's like, "That's like." you know half of human experience are you saying that's uninteresting are you saying half of what humans experience is uninteresting like rocky kind of <laughs> when i interviewed rockio he said that he he doesn't believe there should there's ever a reason to write a sex scene i thought that was really interesting i think western I mean, culture has a lot to do with get it. away with not having one i don't think there's any harm in fading to black to be honest i think it's totally acceptable i think most most western readers would uh i was gonna say i mean i would disagree that that you shouldn't ever or whatever but like i also think that if you're not good at it then don't <laughs> sure yeah i, I just, like just writing it to write it also no yes i would agree with that i do think that there's um there's like prudishness to american culture when it comes to sex scenes which is why like people like guy gabriel k uh get a weird reception because like he actually makes a lot of commentary about the society that the characters are in through the sex scenes and the romantic scenes and <laughs> for some reason American culture we're cool with people getting shot in the head but as soon as someone like starts getting frisky we're like mm. <laughs> okay. it, very um, strange when I read Tagana um, everybody was like warning me about the sex stuff yes. and like I didn't like love it like it bothered me a little bit but like the reason I ended up not liking Tagana was not to do with that at all it was to do with like the story and the magic and the like the plot of the book it wasn't like it's sexist and i hate it i was like it seems a little sexist sometimes like this oh, i don't know how i don't know why this needed to happen but like that, that wasn't why i ended up not liking the book yeah and lions uh, i mean I, I gotta be honest, in lions uh there's multiple scenes and i like if i like the sixth one i think i was like i got it i think i got it <laughs> like we, we can move on you know it's like anything like you can overdo battles you can overdo um political intrigue there's there's a ton of things you can overdo um but I say for the most part except for i mean and i think martin gets worse about it as the series goes on like dance with dragons is the most voyeuristic like the mm -hmm. first three books like i never really felt that way feast it. feast is so feast in retrospect is voyeuristic as well but yeah. we didn't feel that way because for cersei it actually made sense with the way it was indulgent yeah. It actually made a lot of sense. However, then seeing the exact same type of sex scenes and dance then makes you retrospectively go, that wasn't exclusive to Cersei in the disgusting way yeah. it was being described. That's actually just George. That's but also, like, even though it, it it was in Feast and it was with Cersei, it was still also less just in the book. It was yes. there with Cersei a lot. But so, like, in dance, okay, so we retroactively realized that that wasn't the great character work that we wanted to, like, 
credit it with being and also there's just more of it going on yeah um, and the first year books like i didn't really ever feel that way um but i was gonna say that aside if we kind of like forgive the song of ice and fire for like kind of uh, doing that a bit i would say for the most part when it comes to violence sex things like that that can be done badly or overused or or underused like i think all three are pretty good at using them like when it's appropriate if necessary like not afraid to put it in if it is necessary Mm -hmm. um like they're pretty good at like gauging how much and when and not just like more blood because it's cool or like more sex because it's like you know they're they're good at like telling their story and using all the tools at their disposal when they need to and never avoiding something for no reason and never including something for no reason they're good at gauging that yeah i i do know um and it's because I hear it all the time, but a lot of people do criticize Martin for the violence towards women uh, being mentioned in like offhand statements like, oh, that was her uncle or, you know, her uncle beat and, you know, whatever. I was going to say when people talk about how much sexual violence there is in the song Raising Fire, it is mostly that like there's very little on page actually occurring sexual violence. It's mostly like referred to as having happened or referred to as like that is going on, but it's not like the character that you are currently with getting assaulted or doing the assaulting like that's not really much yeah. of it yeah and and i think the reason like some people say that um and and yeah that was really bad and i actually like that book unlike a lot of people but i thought that the sex scene in rage dragon was terrible the, the the females in that book were terrible uh not like them but the writing of them um but yeah martin catches a lot of flack for um you know kind of that culture that is in there and unfortunately uh the bigger issue that i've seen with people who are historians or other writers they take issue because george's defense of it was very uh at the hip and kind of poor and he said uh well that's how it was back then like it it is based a little bit on history so that's how it was back then which if you look at what historians have said the report of a sexual assault in the medieval times was actually at no higher of a rate than it was or is today. However, and I said this today, actually, in my Patreon hangout. So they're all going to say, oh, I heard this before. But my question is, was the reporting threshold for abuse as stern as it is? To, and, it, and, I, and I'm not saying it's good today. I'm just saying I was like, to say, like people report it much less than it happens today. So that, why do we think they were all reporting it back in the day? That that's my like I I think it's now I'm and again I and it's not be, like you're gonna have archaeological evidence of rape like also having enough evidence uh Deshaun Watson right now in the NFL he did not they didn't have enough evidence for him or whatever uh and I'm not saying anything about him but I'm just saying in general not enough evidence does not mean not guilty uh so there, there's a big difference from that they're obvious they're usually in this crime. There isn't a lot of evidence. Um, and also, I just I doubt that there is a large there is the same threshold as today as back then for what constituted assault. Um, but I also don't know if that's true. So I have to give people the credit that at the very I least, mean, I feel like if he's like uh, like he can't say for sure that it happened a lot. We can't say for sure that it didn't happen a lot. What we do know, though, is that like women were second class citizens like far worse then yeah. than they are now and we know that like there's still problems with that now so like the idea that women are treated as objects and would be like used as objects which is what that is i mean of course yeah, yeah. like it's not i mean it wouldn't be reported because i don't even know that they would think of it as assault because they'd just be like whatever it's my right because i won this land and these are the spoils i get the gold the swords and the women like and it, it, it's all about them being men men's property too like if yeah. you were to uh, someone were to abuse my wife it would be a disjust it would be dishonorable towards me not yeah. them as as a human uh they, mm-hmm. they are my property or whatever which is so, i mean like in the present day the same reason that like a girl in a nightclub who gets approached by a guy um, she can say no all she wants. It's only if she has a male friend who's like, hey, she's with me. That Gary like, oh, said this long. today you know. in my patron chat. <laughs> this is <so>, true. <laughs> it, no, it is true. Uh, so you can see how it's kind of dropped down. So uh, all that is to say that I don't necessarily think they're wrong for criticizing George for this. Like this is a very- I mean, It's a bit of a topic. flippant answer to a serious topic, but also- But George would have been better off and I've heard other- I've, I've heard people in the, the realm of scholars say this is they say, well, if- he had just said, hey, it's my fantasy world. I'll do what I want. 
that's fine. You could do that. That's that's a that I wanted to tackle these issues in my family. Okay, cool. But people then take say, well, you said that, but that's not the case. But I just feel like the um, <laughs> the case that it wasn't like that could also probably be argued right can be picked apart well i so, feel like the main argument that also that people use when it, we're talking about speculative fiction is that like who cares if it used to be like that you can make your own choices in your world and you're choosing to include a lot of the sexual assault and that that is a choice and why are you making that choice because like you're not beholden to what happened in history in a fantasy yeah it, i think he probably shouldn't have said well it happened all the time back then so i'm gonna you know what i mean like mm -hmm. he could he should have just said it's my world I can put and I mean, he could even have said a lengthier answer of like the kind of world that I've built and the kind of brutality that I've established is commonplace. It would seem disingenuous to not include brutality and violence of every kind. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then because like to have a world as brutal and violent as a song of ice and fire is, but somehow there's zero sexual assault. I'd be like, mm, unlikely. <laughs> yeah. And it, the feeling that um, that women are always in danger also comes up a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not it's, like all of his women are damsels. No, they're not. I mean, Ar Arya is badass. Uh, Although it is, it is honestly like shocking when you realize that First Law somehow avoids it that like there mm -hmm. isn't any sexual assault because like it's the kind of world that you just like, of course there is, and then you're like, wait, hang on a second, I can't think of a time that there was. That's Which a neat trick. <laughs> you can write grim dark without doing that, folks. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that's mandatory for some reason. So. Um, yeah, it's it is. It is regret. I mean, it is nice to like when you like talk about first law and people are skeptical. I'm like, there is zero sexual assault in it. So, ha ha. There's there's sex, <laughs> but not sexual assault. <laughs> sex. Mm -hmm. um, it is but, just as grim dark as everything else. <laughs> but I always like to point out the the um, the common arguments against George, especially when it comes to the the treatment of females in his book, because you know he's my favorite author. So I feel like it would be bad of me not to acknowledge things that people say even if i disagree with some of their their arguments well and i mean I, again i've only read farcy and live ship but actually where martin came up last night uh he partly came up with like the wit and warging um mm -hmm. is where i brought him up but i also brought him up because and like we just said abercrombie doesn't do this um but hob and martin both have sexual assault and both not assault have weird sex things uh, Abercrombie, like we talk about all oh, squelching and <laughs> but it's still like it's the thing that's like his thing is that you have to be realistic. And yes. so like the sex scenes he writes are like awkward because like humans don't have like perfect the stars erupted uh, as you know, we both came and uh, it was a pure and amazing. Like that's like not well, it's like, like his combat. Novel. It's like his combat, right? His combat is very gritty and down to earth, mm -hmm. whereas uh, like it's not epic. It's like I tripped on my sword. I and danced I with my sword myself. and you know, yeah. arcs of steel came raining down. Yeah, so like Abercrombie isn't like, he doesn't really write weird sex scenes. Like he just writes, like when people tee he about his sex scenes, it's just because like you're not used to seeing them be so like kind of realistic and it's like kind of uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, but like Hobb and, and, and Martin have like weird sex things happen in both of their books. We're like, generation. we're like, me and Barrow were both like, and like she has, I think she read A Game of Thrones like a long, long time ago, but she hasn't really read A Song of Ice Fire. And I was like, specifically um which I, I won't i'm not i'm not trying to spoil it but i'm myself trying to remember which thing it was but i mean there's like a weird sex thing in farseer um mm -hmm. and I'm, i think there's a weird sex thing in live ship there but regardless when i read that i was like well you can tell that george R. R. martin and hob are friends because <laughs> you're seeing like that you're like oh, you do okay. have the same editor so maybe it's the editor's fault or no, there's two weird sex things in Farseer. I'm, I don't think there's a weird sex thing in Live Ship, but there's two very strange sex things in, in Farseer. In Farseer, for sure. I, I feel like there's one that could be maybe classified as not like weird, but maybe a little awkward. Um, and the second one, like not on purpose awkward. It's but still I can't a very that. like, uh, did we, did that need to happen? <laughs> um, what? Yeah. We were having a wholesome, heartbreaking time. What? does that <laughs> yeah i I, th I think i actually think abercrombie hands handles all of that stuff rather well yeah and he also um was like disappointed in himself and then fixed it in like the not having as many female characters in his original trilogy mm -hmm. so like he sure came back like fists pumping like 
great female characters in Age of Madness. And he had good female characters before. There just like wasn't many. Yeah, I would say they were way better in Age of Madness, like way. Yeah, way better. but I mean, like Artie is great, and she's but she's not even a POV. And like people love Artie, but like you don't ever actually see in her head. She's not a POV character. And when I asked him, he's like, I just I never occurred to me to make her a POV. <laughs> so. And that does happen. Uh, there are authors that are very thoughtful and plan out literally every single piece of their stories. And there's some people who write and write the story they have, and then um, they miss some things, and that just happens. And uh, what's the standard? I, I'm not sure, but I know that I'm a lot more forgiving than most uh, when it comes to that stuff. By the way, Daniel Lopez said, I imagine fights in Abercrombie like Timothy Chalamet, single combat and uh, fight in the King. Yes, that movie, movie. Yeah, that movie has some of the coolest fight scenes. I know that it's not like historically accurate. Um, Rocchio actually well, was like that, something about the horses or something. He was like, that's not right. And I was like, I just thought it was fun. <laughs> I don't know anything about horses. The, the movie has flaws, <laughs> but Robert Pattinson kills it. Timothy kills everyone it. in it. It's in the claustrophobic nature of the battle. Oh, <sighs> so good well and also um so the part of history that the king is depicting like those figures from history um shakespeare's like rendition of those characters is what inspired abercrombie in some part to write age of madness wow interesting and like i didn't see it before because i asked some question about like um when he came back to first law was it like oh like i just want to write first law i'll think of something <laughs> or was it like you had a specific like story in mind that you were like i must return to first law because there's this story that you know like i must tell or like you know what what how, how was he coming back to it and he told me that he had gone for over like a couple of weekends to see every single shakespeare history play in order with the same cast doing them back to back to back to back um and that it was brilliant but that specifically um the like henry five plays um like hotspur and um hal is what inspired orso and leo in the age wow. of madness and wow. as soon as he said it i was like oh shit they are like hotspur and how i did it's not put that together uh that's a big similar between george and joe they're both very into shakespeare and, and, and like, hob history. maybe as well yeah hob maybe as well i'm not i'm not sure about that um you know what's also funny is that like blade itself in game of thrones both kind of have a noir feeling because game of thrones is actually a murder mystery and and obviously with the noir setting, it kind of kind of coincides. They both have mm -hmm. that, as does the expanse. Well, and then I actually thought it was earlier um, when we were talking about whether or not Hob is Tolkien derivative and she's not. And like arguably the first law is Tolkien derivative purely because he was intentionally yes. like sub commenting on and subverting the Tolkien arc. Yes, very much so, which I find fun. Some people believe that if you're subverting some uh, an original work that your work can never last. Um, I've seen authors say this before, and I think well, really, look I think at first law. <laughs> I think it's a really dumb thing to say. To be honest, I feel like it. I mean, this is again where it depends. Like if you're if you're writing a story where it isn't a story unto itself, is an entirely a commentary on something, then because uh, like um my friend Heather and I have been reading the Hogarth Shakespeare's, which are all authors commissioned to retell various Shakespeare plays, and the thing is, you cannot read any of them without reading the play because they're all such direct commentaries on each of the plays they're not divorced from it at all like you couldn't just casually like read it and be like that was really good and then be like oh interesting to learn that it was inspired by the tempest but like literally like if you do not know the events of the tempest this book will be like huh <laughs> so like they don't stand on their own and that's why we ultimately think that like sometimes it's an interesting commentary but it feels like it's in conversation with that play it's not a book unto itself yeah. Whereas, like, I don't have to ever like be familiar with Henry V to un to like read the Age of Madness. But if you tell me that he was inspired by Henry V, I'm like, oh, oh shit, you ca I see it. Yeah, that's kind of how the relationship between Memory Star and Thorn and A Song of Ice and Fire is. I, if I had a dime for every time someone said A Song of Ice and Fire is just a clone of Memory Star and Thorn, I one would have a ton of money, but I would also have jumped off a building. Uh, 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 <laughs> of a people, dire rich room man <laughs> the only people who haven't read Memory Star and Thorn say this stupid talking point but to your point good writing will hold up yes um, it is so much fun to go back and read Memory Star and Thorn and see the very little bits that George did take from Memory Star and Thorn it's really cool and again uh, I mean every author is is writing 
um, like standing on the shoulders of the people that came yes. before them because like Tolkien was inspired by all of the myths and legends that he was enamored of. So he was derivative because he was just copying all of like his languages are derivative because they're just like taking his favorite parts of languages that exist and just like mushing them together into a language that he's like, these are my favorite bits together. <laughs> so like no one is, no one creates art in a vacuum. Like you're always yeah. going to be commenting on inspired by affected by all these influences things that you liked things that you didn't like it's always going to be that absolutely also i can't wait for you to read king killer chronicle and then laugh with me about people saying that empire of silence is the name of the wind because it's ridiculous well i'm reading them both in the same year so i'll definitely be able to pull some parallels i just i honestly kind of rage <laughs> like when you were saying that you get angry when people talk about the memory sorrow and thorn comparison I, when people tell me that empire of silence is just a ripoff of name of the wind i'm like i kind of want to punch you in the face right now because that's the dumbest take i've ever heard <laughs> yeah in, half the time people make these kind of assertions i feel like they didn't even read both books but like i know not enough people read memory sorrow and thorn <laughs> because it should be way more recognized than it is <laughs> So if you had read the three and then read all of a song of a and then came to that conclusion, I'd be like, okay, we can talk. But 99% of them have not. And they just parrot something. Well, especially because I'm, I'm pretty sure that Rockio has said that he's never even read the name of the wind. He, I think he said that in my, and when I interviewed, I'm pretty sure he said, well, he I'm sure he's it. brought it up because like he gets sick of people saying that. I'm sure he does. Yeah. But I'm like, if you read it, like if you wanted to accuse it of being like, copying something or being inspired by something or being derivative of something there are things that you could like it's the book of the new sun i don't think it's an accident that he wrote the name of his to be a sun eater like he clearly likes gene wolf he clearly likes the book of the and new he's sun. upfront about that yeah yeah and so like if you want to point to things there are things i mean dune influences are obvious like there mm -hmm. are things and name of the wind is not one of them <laughs> yeah and you know, we kind of talk, you know, obviously Abercrombie pulled from Shakespeare. Um, George pulls a lot of Lovecraftian stuff into his work, especially in, in the in the last two books. Definitely for a few. Hob pulls from Dickens. Uh, yeah, <laughs> clearly. And she might. Cool. Who knows? That's cool. I saw someone say that they feel like Hob pulls a little bit from Earthsea and probably I mean, Ursula Le Guin, it was amazing. Uh, and I'm sure Robin Hobb looked up to her. So I think it's really cool. And I mean, like the. This is where, again, like, I feel like there's a there's a kind of reader that, that enjoys Song of Ice and Fire and enjoys First Law and also, like, doesn't get it. Because, like, if you're just reading it for, like, blood and violence, like, and there is blood and violence. But, like, these authors are doing so much more than that. Yes. And, like, they're only using violence as, like, a tool in their tool belt to tell a greater story or to do a more interesting thing than that. So if that's all you're getting out of it, I'm just like, okay. <laughs> That's the interesting but, thing um, about Hobb is I feel like Hobb doesn't have the the oohs and ahs of the more pop culture. We said it's reading. not as sexy. It's not Crim Dark. It's not Edge Lord. Yeah, it's just, it's just interesting because I feel like Hobb is almost like a pure version of the true intentions behind the other two work in some way. It works. But so them. what I was originally where I was kind of going with that was that like so I think the kind of people that are like like fuck Tolkien like first law like that's cool. The thing is Joe Abercrombie loves Tolkien. Like he didn't decide to like write the subversion of the uh, Lord of the Rings because he hates Lord of the Rings. He loves Lord of the Rings. S same same thing with George. G George has some criticisms. Like I mean, Rocky has some criticisms with Dune. You know, I, it's very it, it, <gasps> yeah. Perfect. I know. <laughs> there's there's reasons why they felt like they wanted to subvert some of these things. And also, let's be honest, it's pretty interesting. And I mean, anytime you're engaging with like a project of like being in conversation with something, subverting something, retelling something, it's because you know it intimately and that yeah. you're able to even do that successfully. Yeah. And if you're going to know it that intimately, it's probably because you like it. Yeah, I'd agree. So, yeah, like there are so many places in First Law where you're like, oh, this is like this part of the Lord of the Rings, except the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> but like if somebody who hated Lord of the Rings and just kind of vaguely knew Lord of the Rings decided to write an anti Lord of the Rings, it would be shit. <laughs> yeah. And let's be honest. The subversion is um, way less tired than the derivative stuff. So, well, because also the subversion doesn't come from a place of like, ugh, I'm going to write something cool because it's the opposite of that. It comes from a place of reverence and also yeah. a place of, but there is a different way to tell this story. There's an equal and opposite way to tell this story. Well, and they also just might see the world differently. Well, I think they do. 
I, I think so. <laughs> Although I feel like both um, Tolkien and Abercrombie are kind of both sassy. Because like, you know that like Tolkien got a copy for free of Dune. And he was did like, not like it. Yeah. And he was like, but not only didn't like it, it was like, do you want it back? Because I don't want this. Yeah. And give it to someone else. Like, he, how? I think, I think he uh, it was like strong disdain. Yeah. 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 Rocky told, uh, talked about that. He, I did not know that. What but I think it's because master. of the pessimistic nature of Dune on heroes. And Tolkien was, you know, extraordinarily optimistic. Which is that, like, he could have just like kept the book and just said nothing about it. But the fact that he was like, do you want this back? I don't want this. <laughs> You're like, oh, shit. Yeah. That's a bit sassy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost even rude. I'm just like thinking like Tolkien on Twitter, like if that was a thing. <laughs> oh my! But anyway, um, yeah, they're all three very, very good. And I mean, for all the lumping together that we do, it's I think also become clear through this conversation. It wasn't clear before that they all have very different strong suits. Even if we do keep saying that they're so similar and. Yeah, and they're all the best. Distinct places in the genre, um, and, and for me, pillars uh, and very formative to who I've become as a reader. Yeah, to riff off of something beautiful, and end up with something different. It does take talent. Well, I think um, I've I definitely have said this about Abercrombie, but I think it's also true of the other two. Like I just haven't actually said it. Um, that much like watching like an Olympic athlete they make difficult things look easy. Like if you watch the gold medal ice skater, like you're like, oh, I could do that. that they make it look easy. <laughs> um, and like the writing, like it goes, not that people don't appreciate these books. I mean, we're talking about this for hours and like they're obviously widely read and much beloved, but like good writing is hard. And like, because they're so good at it, they make it look easy where you don't notice it. You don't, if you're noticing the writing, they've probably done something wrong. So like yeah. the fact that you're reading it and you're just like, wow, this is so good. Um, I, I feel like a lot of the craft of it, like you take for granted because they make it look easy. Yeah. I mean, even, and I've actually seen people, um, you know, say that they're long winded or things, but like I have this pulled up here. It's the, one of the, Catelyn Stark chapters from I think it's a Game of Thrones, but it's about the veil. <laughs> when you said I think it's a Game of Thrones, it sounded like a, it's um it's from this book. Uh, I think it's called uh, I, Have you Game heard of Thrones? Of it? Have you heard of this Oprah's Book Club? <laughs> uh, it stretched before them to the misty east, a tranquil land of rich black soil, wide, slow moving rivers, and hundreds of small lakes that shone like mirrors in the sun, protected on all sides by its sheltering peaks. That's some good shit. Come on. <laughs> You know? That is beautiful. Well, and I think like character voice, you know, that they do when you just like, oh, I love these characters so much like that. You don't even think about like how like incredible it is that they could write people that don't exist in a way that you immediately knew them and felt that you knew them. And they were like distinct people that live rent free in your head that like that's hard. And yet you read this and you're like, oh, this is a good character. Not that like this is incredible writing because it made me believe this character exists. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you got to just sit there and marvel at some of the sentences. Hob more so than almost any other author I've ever read. Um, she's she's ridiculous. <laughs> she's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it does. And I do feel like right, reading Hob is more of a gut punch than any of the like yes. of the three. Yeah. Like when she you is. talked about how much emotionally it must take out of her to read it. That's why it also takes so much emotionally out of you to or when we said to write it for her, yeah. it would be hard that for us to read it. It takes your whole soul. Yeah. Like, uh, realm of the other things, like I think about rereading it, and then I'm like, do I really need to do this to myself right now? <laughs> like, How much of a masochist am I? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think good writers are all like a little bit, you know, I will use flippantly a word that I shouldn't, but a little schizophrenic that like you can have this many, these many personalities like mm -hmm. living in your mind that like the way that authors talk about their characters, like someone in chat yesterday, it might've been Derry was saying that like Robin Hobb talked about 
getting angry with Fitz for making bad decisions yes. because he's just added a hundred pages to her book. And you're like, that sounds like mental illness. <laughs> you're like, yeah. you know, he's not real. Right. Like, you know, you could have, <laughs> he doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. She said that it was an interview uh, between George and her and their, their editor. And she was just like, you know, why are you so mean to your characters? And Robin Hobb goes, I'm not mean to my characters. Fitz just makes bad decisions. And I go, you idiot. You just added 50 pages. Like, what are you doing? You know? all this could be so much easier if you made the right decision. And when I heard that, I was just like blown away because it wasn't like corny when she said it. Like, I think she, I mean, she did, she meant it. And it's like, wow, she's really a person or Fitz is really a person in her brain. It's crazy. Well, I think it's the fact that, I mean, you have to, I don't know, like to juggle in your head, both like I'm a storyteller and I must use my characters as tools to like, perform story for me in the ways that I need them to while also being wholly convinced that these are humans that you have to be like, well, what would he do? Well, what would she mm -hmm. do? What would, how would they feel? What would they say? What do they feel? What do they say? Um, and to like, try to juggle like organically what this character would think and feel and where you're like, well, I need this scene to achieve this thing. Yeah. So it, it's hard. And the fact that they do it so well, like I think, and as much as we praise them, it is even myself. I'm just like, I know I take for granted how good they are at this. That's hard. Yeah, especially when I try to write my own stuff, being inspired so much by them. And I'm like, uh... <laughs> I mean, it is like putting skates on for the first time and being like, oh, I felt down immediately. Yeah. <laughs> Ice skating is yeah. not easy. Yeah, like they it, make it look. Very easy to become paralyzed um, with just seeing what your favorite authors can do and then what you can't do. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think uh, treating your, or thinking sincerely about your characters is yeah, what makes her characters and her, her books feel so sincere. Yeah, I agree. Like, I don't know that it hurts Abercrombie to hurt his characters. And I no. don't know that it hurts Martin to hurt his characters. I mean, I imagine uh, Martin did say that he felt emotionally um, like impacted by like his care. Like basically was just saying to the fact that like, you know, it's not free. Like this does bother me a lot uh, to do these things because I, I love these characters so much. Um, so I think it maybe affects him a little bit. I could see Abercrombie just going. <laughs> well, I know it doesn't because like I asked yeah. him about a specific thing that he did in one of his books. Um, that is very spoilery, so I won't say. And like, <laughs> um, I was like, <laughs> like it's so mean to do that, and couldn't you have like not done that? And he was like, why? Like, why it clearly I? affected you. I did my job. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I did it. I did it good because you wouldn't feel so upset about it if it wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, you stinker. <laughs> yeah, he definitely gets a kick out of it. And like, I mean, at the same time, like, again, like we said before about like the tweet about his own writing, like he is also like a jokester. So like, that's not to say he he doesn't didn't sincerely also feel something. And that's he's not the kind of person that would be like, it broke me to write that. Mm -hmm. he just, yeah. He wouldn't say that. But yeah, he's definitely not that guy. This bus is just being tools. He says that they're tools, but like, again, it's. I think he likes being kind of flippant and glib. Yeah. I mean, I won't lie. Like if that is the case, that would make it a little less great. But also, I guess arguably more impressive that he makes them feel so fully fleshed out. If you really don't think of them as people like, well, you yeah. done fooled us real good. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely a piece though. It's like, if you don't see them like that, why should I? Right. But then there's also what the 99% of readers who aren't going to go listen to an interview with, him you know like they're just readers which is but really I also i mean i think there's a part of abercrombie that i don't want to make this sound like a value judgment but he is more disciplined than george r, r. martin and how he writes and like he even like used that word himself when not in comparison to george r. R. martin but just in right. terms of like when i specifically asked why isn't rd a pov like is it like was there a reason not like hey why isn't she but just like is there a reason that she wasn't like that from mm -hmm. storytelling that you were like, this would mess it up if she was. And that's when he was like, Nope, just didn't think of making her a POV. Uh, but after he gave the like, ah, like answer, he was like, I basically feel like if you've chosen to tell this story and you choose your POVs, then you should stick with those POVs because otherwise whose story is this? And that like, I have, this is my trilogy and I've chosen these to be my eyes on it. And 
they are telling this story and I can't like like go wild with just like adding people in and adding plot threads and things going like you have to like be yeah structured about it and that's why he does write a trilogy all in one draft has his POV is like goes back and makes sure that his clues all lead up to where it ends and like I think I don't know. I feel like the end product can be so callous and disciplined because he allowed himself the time to like kind of go through stuff and feel things out and feel what this character would do and how they would feel. And is this true? And he could feel all the feeling things. And then the edit is like, you are totally like tools in a toolbox callous where you're just like, okay, what doesn't go? What goes? What stays? Like, what am I cutting? What doesn't achieve anything? So I think he can be, they are tools in a toolbox at the end of the day. And I need to have the discipline to treat them that way and kill my darlings. Cause like I wrote a lot of stuff and everything I wrote is brilliant cause I'm brilliant, but also it's not. So like, what do I need to cut? And so I yeah. think he's very like, okay, like you have to be realistic. Not all of this is good. <laughs> so in that sense, I think he forces himself to regard them that way. Yeah, no, that's fair. And it's a measured approach and probably why he's able to finish things, wrap things up, be definitive. Yeah, I'd agree gotta cut it off before you're wallowing in emotion <laughs> <laughs> if you believe anything Abercrombie says that's on you <laughs> yeah um there he says do you guys feel low-key offended by comments like that from authors that are so clearly using Gurren many POVs guarding methods as a negative reference? I couldn't feel offended because I created that. Like when I asked Abercrombie that I was like, well, I didn't ask him that, but I think when he said that he was being disciplined about how many POVs he would have, I was like, cause otherwise you end up with peace for crows. And he was like, I will not comment. on that. <laughs> I, um, I've read Malazan. <laughs> That's my answer. So, POV count doesn't matter. There's like a thousand POVs in Malazan. So and it's um, also like, you know, each storyteller has the right to be as yes all over the place or as disciplined as they And there's are. also a huge difference between a character driven narrative to a character focused narrative. Uh Abercrombie is a character focused narrative. George is somewhere in between. Hob is clearly a uh character focused um um sorry well, character driven i'm sorry character driven would be abercrombie and hob if character focus and driven for martin something like malazan with hundreds or maybe a thousand povs is definitely character focused uh and that's a whole nother can of worms to get in what <laughs> well what what those mean for the narrative structure you pick i mean i love shivers so yeah i'm glad <laughs> <laughs> he better <laughs> but i mean I, yeah and i mean the whole tools in his toolbox i think i mean he didn't say that in the interview with me but i mean this is where also like the we coming back to like which of the authors interested in like lore and secrets to the world mm -hmm. or whatever like that's not abrahami's like it's just not what he's thinking and so i don't know what my question was but we were just talking about like all the times that he uses um previous characters and scenes where like they just pop up and like that's why I always say you should read it in order because like a character will just like pop up and you don't need to know who they are because it wasn't really important to the story. But if you do know, then it's cool and it adds a layer to that scene. Yeah. Um. And the way he talked about it was just like, yeah, well, like it'd be dumb not to do that because like I could have a scene in a tavern. This is a scene in a tavern or I could randomly throw in this character from a previous book. So it just immediately makes it more interesting. So why wouldn't I do that? <laughs> it's like it's very like calculated and callous when he puts it that way but also i'm like yeah and it works wrong it definitely works for him too i think daniel has a good point he says uh with the song of ice fire a lot of the criticism come from book six not being out people trying to find reasons to blame people wouldn't care about pov bloat if there was a book every four years and that is correct i totally agree with then, that i mean there's also like chicken or the egg so like maybe we would have a book sooner if we didn't have pov bloat because we'd have a disciplined tighter like yeah, but We're would it be, it off here. but would it be the same story, no. right? Because a lot of people hate Area Hota and Ariane's POV, but as we found, you know, that was extraordinarily important for learning more about the Prince of Dorne and and everything Dorne's yeah. going to have involved with uh, the next Dance of Dragons. 
And like, I mean, we talked about this in A Song of Ice and Fire Live, the idea that you would force an author to uh, use a different author's writing approach because it's faster or because it's somehow better. Like, no, like as much as I was just like, well, you know, Abercrombie's super disciplined, but at the same time, like that's what works for him. Like either, I don't know if he's making himself do that or that's just how he is, but like, that's clearly like, that's how he does it. Yes. And that's great. And I mean, I appreciate it because that means that I get the ending and wait, wait. I guarantee you'd get the ending. But like yeah. George R. R. Martin, if you made him, you'd be like, okay, buddy, sit down and do it like Abercrombie does it. I mean, the books would probably be shit. <laughs> it's like, that's just like not how he works. That's not how art works. Um, And, yeah. you know, that's probably why Abercrombie probably won't write a thousand page epic because that's not how he works. Uh, you know, I'm, the first law well, trilogy is a little longer, but even then they weren't. I mean, arguably, he wrote a thousand page epic if you think of the first law yes. trilogy as like one book. <laughs> sure. Yep. 100 percent and he did and he did right that's how he wrote it so well so george does pay stuff off phrase seemed auxiliary books one and two and then the red wedding happened yes and there's still a really big piece in a dance with dragons as well we can't see yet yeah it's a it's the whole thing of like even just about a single book like i said like discussing a book as you go in a lot of ways is kind of silly which i mean again we also talked about this is that like the reason that you have faith that this will get paid off is because they have previously like yes uh you know pulled through and it is valid and fair if this is like a first time author and this is your first time through a series when you're like so far this seems pretty pointless and you're yes. like maybe you're gonna prove me wrong and maybe this is going to you know you're gonna pay it off and this is actually going somewhere but until they've actually done it you're just going on faith and george R. R. martin has proved in the past that like if you are patient with him, he does pay things off. So there's reason to believe that he, if something seems pointless, there's probably a reason he's given you a reason to have trust in that, yeah. but it's a leap of faith the first time. Like when you pick up the late itself, you're like, this seems to be going nowhere by now. Like any Abercrombie book I'd pick up, I'd be like, I fully trust you wherever yeah. this, even if it seems like it's going nowhere, I'm sure you know where this is going. Yep. But the first time you're like, I don't know. Is this going somewhere? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, so I think awkward. like if people initially with Song of Ice and Fire, would have had those concerns i'd be like that's valid but at this point i'd be like okay you don't have the next book but like do you really think that he's not gonna pay things off like well the other big thing is people binge the first three and now are waiting uh and obviously it's a long wait i mean that that's fair but um reading something as it releases and binging it are totally different experiences and people don't put enough um weight into that whenever they're reviewing a series like dark tower as a binge is awesome if i had waited for each book i probably would have been a little bit upset with some of the releases but i didn't have to and i said that in my review and i loved it i thought it was awesome well, there's, i mean there's also like pro i mean it's not always better to binge sometimes like it's better yeah. Especially there's like some books that have spent a lot of time catching you, like reminding you of what happened before. And if you're binging it, Hob you're like, it. I freaking know. I just read the previous one. Hob and uh, actually Rocky Rocky had a lot of repetition in book three, in my opinion, uh, which isn't a bad thing. I even said in my review, I said, objectively, this is not a bad thing to do. You should do this. Uh, it's just the sign. For some authors, you can just have a one pager and be like previously on the story thus far. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Robin Hobb oh. does do that. Robin Hobb recaps a lot of stuff in the later books, which I'm sure reading them as you went, it was probably very much appreciated. But binging it, I'd be like, come on, <laughs> let's move it. You know, but I never docked a point. I never went, oh, this is repetitious uh, because there are books that are super repetitious. But there's a so there's a specific situation where like it was definitely because like, I was talking to somebody about this duology and like they just read the first book in that duology and they finished it and they felt exactly the same way that I did about it. And it was not a good way. Mm-hmm. Like it was like this ending, like what the fuck? <laughs> but so like, I was like, okay, but the second one is very, very good. Um, and they're like, I'm not ready to like, and I was like, yeah, well, I read them as they came out. So I had a year to like forgive the author <laughs> for doing that and being like, okay, I've made my piece. I will read the second book. So I was like, yeah, if you don't want to read the second one immediately because you're still angry, <laughs> like I don't blame you. I was that way too. I had a year to cool off and then be like, okay, nice. wow, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, that I, I definitely uh, recap. Do you mean through dialogue or do you mean a forward? Uh, yeah, she she means a forward, right, Leanna? Well, that's what I meant. But you, uh, well, before we were talking about authors that just like sprinkle in like uh, a yes. lot of characters um, saying things that are like, and of course, what happened last week, as you and I recall, but I will say it anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I which, know. I just read it. Yeah. <laughs> which isn't like, it's not the worst thing, but I like a long leash as a reader, personally. Yeah. And again, like there's, um, 
there's also or more organic ways of reminding people what happened and then there's very blunt like remember when this happened just making sure like it, you can the, yeah i feel yeah. like there's better there are ways of re reminding even within the same book there's sometimes you know books that like repeat information because you're like i really want to make sure you got that because that's important for the end um within the same book and like again there's ways of doing it where like it just it feels natural then like yes it was a reminder and i am noticing that you're bringing this up so it's probably important but it doesn't feel like a super unnatural either info dump or like why are they talking like this nobody talks like this they're talking like this to tell me a specific thing please stop it so. yeah i um that was one of the thing with sanderson books <laughs> There's a... exactly like this hello oh. my brother son of the king how have you been since we valiantly defended the castle last book yeah that is not what you should do i almost start i want to write that like ironically you know, like... <laughs> i mean i feel like abercrombie would at some point put in something like that just as a commentary just to yeah. be i mean there's a short story in red country that is entirely him just being a snarky smart ass hmm. <laughs> there's no point to that short story other than just to be like hey <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I would. Um, I liked that Sharp Ends was like a bunch of like offcuts, just like little, just little things that are like in the world. And I mean, Duncan Egg is a bit like that, but it's like a different era. Yeah. Um, and for both Robin Hobb and for George R. R. Martin, I would thoroughly enjoy something like Sharp Ends that would just be like some one off bits of like maybe a character that you. I mean, uh, arguably Abercrombie broke his own really did write prequels for Logan and Glockta and Sharp Ends because there are stories about them from before the times of first law but i like the like just dipping in and seeing like that's not, that's not enough to tell a whole book and there's no reason to include any of those stories in a full book but they were interesting little side things that like fleshed out the world or like were just cool little excursions so like i would totally love to read something like that for realm of the elderlings or for song of ice and fire yeah and like realm of the elderlings has the novellas but I mean, I guess the novellas kind of work like that. Like they, they, um, they're kind of like peaks, I guess. Um, whereas Duncan Egg is like really its own series in a way, yeah. like it's serial, right? Um, and again, it's a different era. So like seeing one-off stories, like Sharp Ends is like pretty contemporaneous with the books mm -hmm. that we have. So like if you had these one-off, like yeah, maybe short story about Hot Pie, and <laughs> just like a day that he was having, <laughs> <laughs> or give me Arthur Dane. That'd be into more prequel territory. Please. I'm fine with it. Just give me Arthur. I just love the sword of the. <laughs> but Boy. I mean, since we did the, you know, sort of get these quick prequel type glimpses into Glockta and Logan, like what would be some moments that get alluded to? Because like the things that we get for Glockta and Logan, are, again, no spoilers, but they are specific moments in their lives that we had heard about in First Law, and so the short story is like, okay, so here is it happening. Um, yeah. So if there, if you had the opportunity to have like sharp ends, but Song of Ice and Fire edition. Um, what like mentioned thing for a like, character that's like in the series would you want to see like that actually happen in a short story yeah i mean there's so many things in a song of ice and fire that's like one of the, the best things about it is because there's so many characters that yeah, have like little are. histories given but like i would die for i'm trying to think of like of a relevant now character like honestly renly like renly like after book one but before we see him cl in clash or i feel really like really fun to be similar to the type of thing we got in sharp ends in terms of like what pieces of their past we saw if we actually saw jamie um coming getting to knighted. the not getting knighted but when he does his king slaying yeah how that actually went down instead of everybody's idea of how that went down yeah you know yeah and he kind of explains it right um and it, that's one of the fun things about like history is that depending on who's telling it it depends on who's the good guy and bad guy and in jamie's story he's the good guy um oh god and it's so important yeah it'd be sweet here is the song of ice and fire jimmy voice i haven't heard that almost all night when you're so just like oh but like, you know, i'm oh, just thinking oh so god i mean when you just when you just think about how much it parallels with brienne Oh, oh man, we've it's lost so him. <laughs> Doing another reread. <laughs> or um, for uh, Jora, some of this stuff from his past would be. Interesting yeah, Jora would be interesting. Bar Barristan could be cool too. Uh, if he did Duskendale, uh, whenever he saved Ares when he shouldn't have, when he should have just let him die. <laughs> or um, Davos the smuggler. 
Yeah, Davos the Smuggler. That'll probably be a TV show one day. Uh, <laughs> Is it going to be called that? Uh, Melisange, when she was sold yeah. into slavery. That could be interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. How about how about Robert and Ned out on the road? Like a buddy cop. <laughs> oh, oh, come on. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> So honestly like my first what the first thing i was gonna say was anything to do with the iron islands because there's so much that gets like you don't see that much of it in the books mostly what you know about it is like people mentioning things that happened like show me all of it whole sharp ends that is just iron island stuff yeah it could be pretty brutal too because their past like maybe how they organized their rebellion um whenever the war um whenever um, robert's rebellion was going down whenever they rebelled right after that would be really cool how about the reigns of castamere as a story how about that like Tywin, like seeing Tywin become Tywin. oh man it's like the darth vader origin story <laughs> i like how this is all just bare uh, this is all basis for fanfic by the way like, like i'm sure if we yeah. google it there's probably all these stories written by but that's somebody. the thing sharp ends isn't fanfic it's i know saying this is canon. He, wrote, he wrote his own fanfic it's awesome <laughs> i know it's awesome Yeah, you could do that whole. That could be a not a novel. Like you could easily get. But a I think like novel. it almost would be like the whole novel. I don't know. I feel like it'd be too much like a, a disappointing prequel because you know where this is going. You know the end point. But a novella where you're just like just a glimpse of like this one pivotal moment. Well, that's true. Happened. Well, also if you give the POV of Brandon Stark, you would answer a lot of questions. I mean, honestly, if you did a novella about Rhaegar, then that would no longer be such a mystery. That'd be sick. But at the same time, that's when Abercrombie is right. If you did that, it would no longer be interesting. You could also do it through Arthur Dane's POV, though, since he was at the Tower. See, now we're getting this part. <laughs> but again, so. that's where, like, that he's not wrong. Like, the reason that we're so fascinated by it is because we don't know. If yep. we get that answered, we will cease to care. Yep. That's why there's uh, there's ink spilled on the page uh, when it comes to Dunk and Egg's end uh, in the World of Ice and Fire book, which is such a good move by George. Have you ever heard that story? okay so in the world of ice and fire there's a section that covers eggs rule as king and this dunk is, is in his Jimmy. i've missed you <laughs> <laughs> well this i th i thought this is hilarious so george wanted because it's written by maester he wanted to literally spill ink on the page and sell the book that way like with an ink blotch and they were like george if we do that people will return the book because they think it'll have a defect and he was oh, like, I but I want it. And they were like, no, you can write that this page was destroyed in translation. So they had to stick with that. But George, the madman, wanted to print a page in a $40 book with an ink stain on it. I just thought it was just so like creative. Like, there are like mixed media books where they do that kind of thing. But if your whole book hasn't been mixed media and you just do that on the last page, like people would not think that that was it's such a cool over. play on the narrative or no, I'm sorry, the narrator of it. Like the, mm -hmm. who, who is writing the history? Like, it's so cool. Ugh, I love that. And I think that's a thing that, um, Abercrombie is not, this is not a thing he shares with them, both Robin Hopp and George R. R. Martin, not just in terms of like, Oh, picking your POV. Like all three of them are good at that. Um, uh, but like who is telling the story, which is mm -hmm. a different question from whose POV you're in. Yes, like the fact that Fitz 100%. is telling the story, it's not just from his perspective. He is telling the story from his past and saying, this is what happened to me Yep. that like, and throughout a song of ice and fire, like who is telling the story is a big theme. Yeah. And I think that that's a question that as readers, we should ask ourselves more often when we're reading who lives who dies who tells your story <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is such a george thing <laughs> but i want it <laughs> i mean I, I mean i guess i would go so far as to say that both robin hobb and george r, r. martin are a little more sincere <laughs> in their writing than ever Crombie. yeah maybe george to a fault yeah, I mean, it obviously comes off as a very different. The narrative doesn't feel sincere the way Robin Hobbs does, but like I feel like they both believe in their own worlds a lot more than Abercrombie does. Abercrombie is like, I can do some interesting things in this world that I have created. Not like, I don't, I don't think he regards it as a living, breathing world the way that Robin Hobb and George R. R. Martin regard their worlds. 
Yeah, and maybe it's because uh, I think Abercrombie's is much more of a commentary. And it's a lot more interested in, like, I mean, I think, I don't know, I think he genuinely, like, is into the character stories that he's telling, but he's not interested really in world building. Like, that was no, he's not. not, and it's not just, like, a lower thing, just world. But he like, does have really good, cool world building, though, because of the yeah. uh, the aging of, of the world. Like, actually, But again, it's more of, like, a. I don't think it's realistic for a world to stay the same, and what would it do to my characters for the world to progress? Yeah. I'm interested in what it does to people to see how they change because like the economy changed because industry changed because magic changed. What would that do to my characters? Like that's the only, the only thing he's interested in. And I mean, yeah. it comes to magic is like, what would magic do to my characters? Like he doesn't really care about like, what if I developed this magical system in this world that worked this way? And the mystery of that is, eh, no, nah, yeah. but what if there was magic that did this thing and how would that affect my characters? <laughs> Yeah, and those are uh, actually pretty important questions to ask, uh, switching of ages and how they impact people. Um, like eventually we will get into an age of post-scarcity where everyone kind of just exists. And that's a that's a good one for maybe sci-fi, Joe. To I was going to say, have you read Scythe by Neil Shusterman? I have not, but my, my wife has, and she enjoyed it a lot. So that's kind of what that's about. At least the first book. She enjoyed the first book a lot. I enjoy the first book, and I think the second one is better is like really? i thought the first one was like oh that was good and i was like definitely gonna read the next one and then thunder house like, oh that was so good maybe i should give it a shot i mean it's that concept is that we solved death death is no longer a thing that humans would actually need to deal with so we invented like basically grim reapers of our own to be like well people do need to die though because like we just can't have everybody all the time so, <laughs> your job now to go around killing people off you go <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I would, I personally also mostly care about characters. So that's why he's my number one. Because, um, like, I mostly also, like, that's the thing that usually bothers me. And that's why I can't be enamored of books like Sander, Brandon Sanderson's. And again, that's not, honest, sincerely not a value judgment. Like, if you are interested in, like, magic systems and just, like, that for itself and, like, worlds and that for itself... I, I mean, I'm really happy for you. I'm not like I care about like seeing people put in different environments and what that how they react to that. And that's yeah. why I love N.K. Jemisin. I love Abercrombie. I love authors that are like, that's the question they're asking. And that's why most of the time high magic worlds also don't work for me because I feel like you have not thought through the butterfly effect of even the smallest change in your natural world, which is what magic is, is a change to like the physics of your world, basically. And you have not thought through how humans as a collective and as an individual would react to this, their world being different. Like if you change one thing, everything is different and they do big magics and 50 different kinds of big magic. And I'm like, you have not thought through how humans would react to this. And it shows. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot more. I mean, it's, it's just another piece of the equation that you have to account for and it's already hard enough to write. So kudos to people who do take that plunge. Uh, and which is, I challenge. mean, having higher magic and still doing that, which I, even though Abercrombie <laughs> is my favorite, it is more impressive that Robin Hobb and George R. R. Martin can have attention on lore, magic, world building, and the characters. Yeah, and I think specifically with the song of Ice Fire, the fact that magic's coming back in allows him to answer those questions about how the general folk would feel about this. Because even when we hear about, you know, rumors of dragons, like many people are like, uh, uh huh, okay, sure. Uh, there's even some people who don't believe they even ever existed, they, even though they're, you know, it was only about 100 years prior. I think the last dragons die out, or uh, maybe, no, maybe it's 500 years. I can't remember. Um, but I think he gets to play with it a little bit more because it's reintroducing it slowly. Um, and he does a pretty good job with it. Yeah, but I just, I mean, I guess of the three that arguably the most impressive is, I mean, like we talked about for the George R. R. Martin's, like, that's why he can write a history of his world. That, yeah. like, that he's done all of that work with how his magic works, how the religions work, how the history works, how everything like that works. And also pay attention to the individual characters in his world and how they feel about it and how they think about it and make them feel like real people as they navigate this whole world. Like, I don't know, like the, to be spinning so many plates is impressive. It is many hats, many, many hats. 
and like Hob, like next best to that. So I mean, I haven't finished Realm of the Elderlings, but like next in terms of like do paying almost equal attention to the history and lore and building out of that. And that's a mystery unto itself. Not just how does this affect my characters, but like I'm just purely interested in like what is this magic thing? How does it work? Where did it come from? Who are these magical things from before? What is the history of that? Um, yeah, like, and, and also knowledge. obviously the deep dive into like fits and all the characters and like how they feel. Yeah, and then lost knowledge is a very natural thing through history, and I really like that Robin Hobb plays with that. I mean, Abercrombie mostly just cheats with that. <laughs> He's like, uh, it's no lost. No one knows. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no Which one is knows also valid. Yeah. Definitely valid. <laughs> Which, I mean, like, I asked him, uh, so, like, the names of the Northmen, you know, they're all kind of, like, weird names, and, like, we learn um, that they are all, like, names that come from they, it's like a given name at birth it's like something you did or a nickname that's given to you and like logan says at one point oh that's a naming wound that they probably name you after that and like he's called logan nine fingers because he's missing a finger and um <laughs> like you have the dog man and red three trees and you have stranger come knocking and you have like all these bizarre names and some of them we get backstories for like we do learn shivers backstory um we learn um, we know Logan Nine Fingers story, um, but for most of them we don't. Um, and I was like, "Do you have like even if you never wrote it in the book? Like, do you have in your mind when you wrote those names some backstories for those names?" And he was like, "Nope." <laughs> I just thought they sounded cool. <laughs> <laughs> well then, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> That's so funny. I think for specifically Stranger Come Knocking, he was saying that like he really it was a some day where like someone came knocking <laughs> like literally that's what made him think of it i love that name though i mean it is such a namey name it is and to his point not knowing the next stories of them like allows you to sort of like it's the world feels real for not knowing it because like you wouldn't know all of them and someone probably would have no backstory it would just be some stupid and a lot of them are like if they have a backstory it's such a thing that like i don't even know how that started when people will like people will say that like in yeah. real life be like I like you have a nickname and you're like, when did you get that name? Like, I don't know. I feel like people have always called me that. Like, or they change the story over time. I mean, that Shivers. definitely happens too. Yeah. <laughs> Shivers literally, like you get his version and then you get the true version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Nine Fingers is a badass name, but he, that's a, uh, I mean, we did have a chat about that too, about how like you could easily like fall into the trap of the like, naming them all something like, uh, I think the name he suggested was like Ragnar Blood X. <laughs> they're like, they're all that. And I was like, you have to name somebody that. Now he's like, yeah, I do. Um, but like, there aren't like all like badass names, you know, like that they would oh, have yeah. weird names. Well, some people's is, are, are embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> but like Red Three Trees, you're like, I mean, it's not, it's not embarrassing or badass. It's just like, huh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're not even sure how you compare those together. <laughs> Someone I know is called Biscuit. <laughs> and I mean, that's the thing of like nicknames, like they kind of do come weirdly and organically sometimes. And I like that he didn't have like a strict naming convention with it either. Like Logan is Logan, like that's his given name, but he's called Logan Nine Fingers or the Bloody Nine. Um, and then you have like Rudd Three Trees. I would imagine Rudd is his name and then Three Trees is like the nickname. But others like Dogman... You just call him dog, man. Shivers. I guess they call him call shivers. Um, but like, there's not like stranger come knocking. Like, what the hell is that? So like, there's no like specific, like it has to be like their name followed by the nickname or it has to be, you know, like it's like all over the place. We had this guy um, back in high school. We did backyard wrestling. We all had our stupid names. Right. And we couldn't think of a name for our friend, Ben. And uh, we were at dinner with our other friend's dad and he got butter on his knuckles. And he goes, oh, I got some butter on my knuckle. Oops. And we just said butter knuckle. And that was his name. <laughs> Like, that's perfect. Ben, you're now butter knuckle. And everyone in high school called him yeah. butter knuckle. It was so busy. It made no sense. Like it had no bearing, you know, that, that's how flighty names are. Oh, Does, um, do you watch what Seinfeld? Yes, of course. It's like T-Bone. And yeah. George so desperately wants to have the nickname T-Bone. And then some other guy is like, oh, I like T-Bone. We should call you T-Bone. <laughs> like, what the heck? <laughs> oh. George is the man. Given name the earned name Dog oh, God, man. <laughs> <laughs> People always called me the because they knew one day I'd have a follow up to that. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, I will say it is sometimes jarring to me in Hob books. The names are sometimes very fantasy names, and sometimes they just feel so modern. Like Kyle, you got a name oh. named Kyle. Kyle, have you heard George Carlin's <laughs> stand up about boys' names? Oh my goodness. You should uh, you should listen to it. I'm not going to do a disservice by quoting it, but he shits on the name Kyle pretty hard, and it's really maybe funny. that's what inspired Hob to name a character like it Kyle. Might have been Kyle, you know, Kyle. <laughs> it's just the way he says it. It's so funny. It's just like I mean, like Fitz Chivalry Farseer, and then Kyle. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> it's like Kyle, Tom, and Tucker. These are not real names. <laughs> These. <laughs> What happened to Vinny? See, and Tom, though, that that checks out to me as a fantasy name. Kyle? No. Yeah. Did you see there was like a meme that was like about how some people cannot be cast in period pieces because you just have a face that looks like it knows about social media and technology. <laughs> that like you just look modern. Like your yeah. face knows the future. And it's like that's a name like that. Like Kyle. I'm like, that's no, you can't name somebody. That's a name that like goes to high school. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, but at least it was fantasy version of Greg. Kyle is just Kyle. Greg. How did you get the name Jimmy Nuts? That's uh, a long story. <laughs> it's, it's a long, long story. And by long story, I mean my real name is very close to that, unfortunately. Uh, so I just shortened it. I was about to say, I didn't think it was a long story. <laughs> it's, it's not actually. I don't want to dox myself, so... All oh, Malazan names, yeah, Malazan names are re really random. The their uh, keyboard smashes are too common. Uh, yeah, Stillwater is one of my favorite names. I don't know why, but I've always liked that name. Well, like as 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 cool as I thought Whiskey Jack was, I was like, this does, one of these is not like the others. Yeah, it like, stands out. What is really that really one? <laughs> he is Amanda. the Kyle. Of <laughs> He's like, Kyle. what is this one? <laughs> It's like yeah, they plop down like a redneck in the middle of uh, the universe, like with that. It name, sounds like right? something from a Western or a pirate thing. Like or... Dujek One Arm. That's a name. Like uh, Anna Mander Rake. Like that, that that's is a, a namey name. That's a badass. You can't name. have this uh, same book have Anna Mander Rake and Whiskey, <laughs> Whiskey Jack. Jack. It's like Jack Sparrow stumbled <laughs> on into ye olde middle medieval fantasy world. Like what? <laughs> I love the name Tavor. Um, that's like a name I would like to name a kid of mine. I'd love the name Tavor so much. I have to say, like, my one of my favorite like books for names, and it's not a favorite book, is Dune. I love the and not just like Paul. people names. Okay, not Paul, but not just people names, but like the words for things and yes. the names. Like, oh, there's so much namey names that like I want to find excuses to say them like you can talk about the book without saying those words but i will choose to say them or just like <laughs> yeah. i don't actually have a point to make but i Benny just Jezzer. wanted to say yeah or like quiza tadarak like that's just like oh what even is that like i don't have anything to say about it but i want to say it <laughs> <laughs> yeah do not uh, you know and those older authors took a lot of pride in their naming conventions like uh steven donaldson was very big into latin like i don't think he like loves latin but he dug into latin to get names and for well, things i think there's also um an appreciate a tolkien-esque appreciation of purely the sound of language which isn't the same as like wordplay or being good at prose it's just like the shape of the word is beautiful so like Quizat Tadarak, like that isn't that's not like good wordplay, that's not good prose, but like you've put together something that sounds like a heck of a thing. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like and I, I feel like that gets mocked, you know, fantasy for having like weird names that are unpronounceable. But I feel like there are authors that really do pay attention to just like the sound of a thing. And then also having a cohesive sound where like this all feels like a different world that isn't necessarily, oh, okay, so everything sounds German. All right. But like you can invent your own sound and have it sound cohesively like these. Yeah. Yeah. Tad Williams does it. Tad, Tad Williams is, you know, we talk about like big world and we kind of talk about like Tolkien to George, but like Tad built his own language. Like, I mean, he, he really went the route and it's really good. Like it's really good. And he, he has his own sounds. Apparently it's, it's kind of derived from Finnish. Um, hmm. But I, I don't I mean, it's again, just like with like storytelling, like you're not creating in a vacuum, like obviously yeah. you're going to be 
drawing from existing language. But speaking of names, though, like, I do think this is another strong shoot of all three authors that, like, for the most part, though, like, there's a sense of place and geography and status that comes from names. And it's, again, a missed opportunity for a lot of books where they're just like, oh, name it fantasy stuff. Whereas, like, you can really make a world feel lived in. Like, the, when you go to where Daenerys is, all the names, they all sound like made-up things. Like, all of the things in, well, you know, Song of Ice and Fire sound made up. But, like, they, it's a very different flavor of made up where she is that feels cohesively like it's part Mm -hmm. of that area versus like where you are in Westeros and even in the North, like how things, the names, like without you ever having to info dump anything, you're making your world feel real. Yeah. The, uh, and Marine, all the names, you know, his dar, all that stuff. It sounds so good. Um, and and it is, it sticks out because it's unique and that's part of like, probably because of dune right like dune did do that very very mm-hmm. well so but i mean i think hob and abercrombie also take that same opportunity like as much as yeah. i made fun of kyle i mean like hob does like the names of the different parts of the world the different like echelons of society like yeah it, like she uses names also of places and of people also so. the naming convention of like after like a trait right like mm-hmm. uh, regal you know I, it, it's when I first read, I'll be honest, I was kind of like, really? Like, I mean, when you tell people doing... the main characters fits chivalry farcy, or you're like, yeah, no, I, really? it, <laughs> when I first started reading Assassin's Creed, I was a little put off. But then by the end, I was like, I like it. Shrewd. Mm-hmm. King Shrewd. You yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things Hob does. And like, we, me and Mara talked about last night. We're like on paper. If you're just like that, you hear this is a thing that's in this book or that this is going to be like talking to animals talking ships they're named after traits like patience and verity you're just like that sounds like the dumbest thing ever i <laughs> do not want to read that <laughs> but like how at this point you could tell me she was going to be writing about talking baking soda and i'd be like all right i'm sure it's going to be it's great gonna be sick <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i mean also i mean abercrombie also i think the names of the north the names of the agriant the names of gurkle like yeah definitely sound. the gurkle in the north definitely and stereo sounds distinctly yeah. different. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think they all do that. <laughs> yeah, they really start from scratch. <laughs> like Harry Potter fanfic. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and I mean, Fitz is a real word. It means bastard. So. Allegedly. Yeah, and it's you know interesting to introduce, like keep that in her world as true. That, like, and I think that's an interesting thing that fantasy authors have to navigate is like which things that are true in our world are also true there. Because like the fact that they speak English is like, oh, well, that's a happy coincidence. I would imagine an entirely <laughs> different world wouldn't. And the fact that they have monarchy and they have humanoid species, this all seems very convenient and unlikely. So like, how much are you gonna make it? like our world and how much stands on this and in language it's particularly difficult because like figures of speech and things like that that you just like lean on as like oh that expresses what i'm trying to say but then you're like okay but where does this figure of speech come from is it like a biblical reference and like they don't have the bible in this world so like they wouldn't say that do i want to come up with like a clumsy everyone knows that's the expression but it's like the in-universe version of that expression because that can be really corny or like you know like how much is being pulled over so like fits meaning bastard is like from I me mean, that's part of language um but you know like to pull that over like she could have invented a fantasy thing that means bastard yeah you have to draw the line somewhere you know um and that is a very good question where do you draw the line because some people use modern day terms and then it'll just tear me right out of the world um i feel like because a lot of this stuff is medieval inspired like terms that existed then like bastard and such like mm-hmm. even though obviously they we're speaking in english and they might be speaking a totally different language um it still like resonates and sounds like it fits you know but if someone was like fits. yo that shit slapped like i'd be like oh boy what <laughs> yeah <laughs> excuse me but i think there is like, attention to detail too that i think i read a lot of books where especially like like idiomatic expressions where i'm like okay you know where that comes from, right? Like uh, that does, that's not in this world. Like, why would they be saying that? Mm-hmm. Like, um, I got so, I mean, I have an entire video ranting. And so I did this wrong all of the time, but like, um, in half sick of shadows, which is like an Arthurian lady of the lake story, which, you know, that's like startling the line between historical fiction and speculative fiction, but it's still like the expression that she used was, um, smoke and mirrors. And I'm like, 
okay, they didn't even have the technology to make mirrors, let alone the magical convention used by like illusionists to do smoke and mirrors. And then it was only in the 1970s that the expression smoke and mirrors was like people started using it. So are you telling me the lady of Shalott said smoke and mirrors? She's who began it. Like, she, I she, think not. She, she started it. But it's like stuff like that where you're just like, oh, it's an expression. And I'm like, okay, but you have to think about it. Like, where did that come from? And yeah. like, would they be saying that? <laughs> so, you're cringe AF, bro. I mean, I would honestly live for that if Giselle said that. Because we know he's thinking it. <laughs> Fortnite. Yeah, some people do actually get um, some different times. Like instead of saying months. Mm -hmm. But then some people do just say months and we just kind of accept it. I'm okay yeah, with that. I, mean, I, do I think it's mad. the way that seasons work in a song of ice and fire is a unique choice that winter isn't like, they're not like, Oh, this coming winter as every year that winter is coming. Isn't just like, man, the Starks every freaking year are just like, yeah, we know winter is coming. It comes every year. Like we get it. <laughs> like, yeah. And then like the long summers, um, which like, really is like climate change, like rapid yeah. climate change. Yeah. And the fact that the um, the wall has been weeping, you know, uh, th there's actually that's actually kind of a cool play. George could have probably even done more with it, um, but he did. If you think about it, like mass migration from the north mm -hmm. coming down. Now, obviously, it wasn't just because of weather. It was because, well, the winter was coming, but also because of, you know, walkers and such. But the winter um, was literally coming. Yeah, that 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 piece of the story is so fascinating to me still, even mm -hmm. after reading it all these times. And you know, Jemison did that very well in Broken uh, Broken Earth. She she was able oh, yeah, to. Yeah, we were going to chat about Broken Earth at some point. Uh, let me know. <laughs> we'll <do the laughs> we'll get off thing. of our Abercrombie Martin and Hobb kick. Yeah. <laughs> talk about something else. Well, I love NK. I mean, she's definitely up there for me. Yeah. Um, and, and that trilogy has a lot to do with climate and stuff. But like that's something that uh, that authors should play with more. I would love to see that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But again, I think it can be done lazily where like you haven't thought through how this goes. Yeah. Or it's just like an allegory, it. like straight allegory for. Or it's just like it's like a thing that happens in a way that you're like it creates like a problem that's specific to the plot you want to tell, but doesn't like actually largely affect all of the little things that it Dude. would affect. And like NK Jemison like has clearly thought through how everything is affected. Yeah. I mean, it's central to that. I, yeah. I would say, and, and it's done very well. I loved how it ties into the magic as well. Um, mm -hmm. I just finished the God is not willing. And there's like, not, it's not like climate change, but it's like, well, I don't know. There's an event. There's a weather type event that happens that is so different from anything I've ever read. Um, the only other person I can think of that was done is Hob <laughs> and she did it really well. It's in rain wilds. And um, yeah, but I just read in the God is not willing. And I loved it. It mattered so much and caused so much issues for everyone in the book that very, like you said, trickles down into the little things. So cool. I mean, like the very way that society is organized, infrastructure is done would be different if you change things about your natural world. But yeah, yeah this, is, this is why you get moons. So like we don't have weeks and months because then you're what are we naming the months and what are we naming the weeks? And you're like many moons. <laughs> yeah. Brian Lee Durfee actually does all of his stuff through moon phases um, in his books. And I thought it was really, really cool. So I don't think you've read The Wolf yet because I think you would have told me. Um, no, yeah, I haven't read it yet, but I want to. I so an interesting thing that I don't I mean, I often talk about how amazing to like this is a very different kind of amazing world building because it's anthropological in the like this is a different species. So how they organize themselves and how they function isn't just like, OK, their world is different. Like they are wired differently. So like they wouldn't organize themselves the same way. Yep. They don't function the same way. Yep. So like one of the things that is like interesting about the Anakim is that they they have the year split up by like weeks. Like they have names for the year by the week because that's, that's cool. how attuned they are to the nature and what changes in the nature at like that minutia. It's not like vaguely summer is warm. It's like we know week to week what is beginning to bloom, what is ended blooming, what is coming up, what is like going away. And we've named every single week because that's how like keyed in we are. That's pretty cool. I, I'm actually really excited to read that, especially that's from crazy. anthropological stance that'd be cool it's, and they're kind of vikingy so it's also very cool <laughs> <sighs> um i mean i also hate that 
Yeah, you got to pick words that are rounded because it actually does make sense in the world to use storms because it's like capital punishment. I actually get it, but it just doesn't sound. But good. it also is the fact that it's what world has only like one exclamation, only one swear or you know like it's just it can't storm, always storm be that. father yeah there could be more and i just think that storm isn't a great word even like wheel times uh light and bloody ash or whatever blood and bloody ashes um like those sound rounded and sharp uh they have like a, a whipping to them when you say it's like there's a reason to like fuck it's so like status was, it's a very i was about to say that it's very yeah. sharp word or even damn damn is very rounded at the end uh in storms you would think oh that might mm. it ends in an m yeah, storm you doesn't work. It really doesn't. And I mean, I felt the same. I just read. Uh, I'm not actually sharing my opinion because I'm not allowed to share my opinion on this yet. But Warbreaker by Brandon Sanderson, Hillary picked that for me. And in that, you get colors, and that's the like exclamation colors. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, it's not good. Doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> doesn't work. <laughs> it really doesn't. But it makes sense because Brandon Sanderson doesn't swear. So he doesn't know. You could come up with a cooler fake swear. But unless if you swear a lot, you do you don't know it sounds good, you know? Like he hasn't sat around and thought about the the Well it's co something comes back to like coming fuck. up with like Quizat's Hadarak, like just the sound of words. Like this is a different wordsmithing. This isn't like an artfully crafted sentence that well, has multiple meanings. This is just like today. You how can't does this time. Sound? I can't... mean that's all I'm saying. Quality over quantity is all I'm you saying. You sacrifice something for velocity, folks. Like I'm not saying we all authors should write trilogies where it's like two books and then 20 years later we're hoping for a book three. Like that's that's the opposite end of the spectrum. <laughs> we're not. Sure. There's we're a happy medium. That. There's a happy but, medium. But like Patrick Rothfuss is an author that like I mean he's also the when we were talking about how the pros of the three authors we're here ostensibly to talk about tonight um, don't get lauded for their pros that much even though they have great pros. Patrick Rothfuss obviously does get lauded for his pros. Yes. Um, and it, I mean he does like it's clear that he's like, I mean, he's expressed that he has mental health issues and that he's an obsessive perfectionist. And you're like, I mean, it shows that like you went over every sentence over and over and over again to make them sound as good as possible and that you're not satisfied. It's like a thorn in your shoe that you're like, that doesn't sound perfect yet. That doesn't yeah. sound perfect yet. I have to make it perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hood's breath. I, feel I love that. Hood's breath. Hood's breath. Oh. Hood's breath. I say it all the time. It's seven hells from. <laughs> or um, in first law, by the dead. But yeah, that that sticks. By the dead. Back to the mud. Back to the mud. Back to the mud. I'm getting a tattooed on me. <laughs> I really am. I just don't know when. I was gonna say, considering that that means dead. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to. Yeah, I want to do something with that. And we'll but I mean, those are me. without inventing words. Then inventing expressions that are unique. Yeah, putting to words world. together. Yeah. Um, but then I mean inventing like, you know, those are like that's part of world building that I think also gets either, you know, it's kind of lazy to just be like colors. I mean like, okay, but come up with like actual like how is your culture function based on like maybe a, a color-based magic system? What other expressions might arise out of that that might be an a like expression of alarm, it might be a swear, it might be, you know, you could come up with a lot of like figures of speech and idioms that kind of come from that. And it's just like overlooked. And I think um, like Abercrombie and Martin are very good at coming up with like yeah. in world idioms and expressions that feel natural. Yeah, they definitely do. Ugly is incest. That's a pretty good one. Or um, Pharaoh constantly calling them pinks like that feels completely yep. natural. Or fat pink mask or whatever. <laughs> On, that is not the kind of pink that I was talking about. <laughs> it's a very different <laughs> pink. <laughs> Also, like Hood's balls. That always made me laugh. What is that from? It's from Molasses. <laughs> like, I, was just, I don't recognize that. Hood's balls. And I, I, I actually said it this past week. <laughs> yeah, good is, Germ is so good at branding. Yeah, it's one of his biggest strengths. Yeah, uh, I also think that Pierce Brown is really good at naming. Mm -hmm. um, he keeps it simple, but it works. And again, it's all that kind of stuff that makes it feel like a cohesive, yes. real world. I didn't um, need to go there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> couldn't help yourself. Yep. Yeah. But I mean, at that point, like, I honestly wish you just, like, didn't have any yeah. kind of... Like, just don't. A... Just don't. T Tog Steets is also a good one. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> There's so many good ones. Uh I mean, I feel like one of the laziest ones that I see the most often is like, I think a lot of fantasies because they don't want to be accused of ever commenting on a real world thing. They'll make it polytheistic because it's like no one can say it's a commentary on Christianity if you make it polytheistic or like you still can. But like, um, you know, they'll just like vaguely make it some gods. And so then they'll just uh, make the same expressions that we have, but replace it for the singular with the plural. So people aren't like, oh, my God. They're like, oh, my gods. And you're like, it's your niche in my world. <laughs> you're like, no. Yeah, I uh, I saw I read um, Alexander Darwin's a self-published author. He did a uh, trilogy called The Combat Codes, and I, I actually really enjoyed it. But um, dark is like considered a swear word. And he said like there was one character who is like rough and he'd be like, you darken idiots, you know, dark, 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 dark and dark, dark. And he's like, oh, my God, this is terrible. Like, like, I like the books, but like that piece of it was really tough for me to get through. And I actually I end up, you know, telling the author that actually because he asked me for feedback. But um, books are good. But I told him, I said, you got to cut down the, the in world swears because every time he says dark and I just want him to say fuck, like <laughs> it just doesn't work. Right. I was actually thinking of it like it's not ideal that like that's a swear either because of like real world like oh dark is bad like yeah yeah not yeah. ideal yeah. yeah not great just make up a word yeah <laughs> um uh there was another one i think i Pink thought of mess. oh well i forgot about it character we yeah. knew becomes swears in other cultures yeah that is a cool piece of that world for sure storming inspiration spring <laughs> But I think it's also the fact that like, uh, and I think George R. R. Martin in particular is good at this kind of thinking, but the other two are good as well. And a lot of others are not. Is that like the most direct idea of like how a situation or a, a faith or whatever would result in an expression and that it's this direct one-to-one -one, and you're like, okay, but that's not how cultures, like we just talked about nicknames. Like they just come out of freaking nowhere that like they, they spring up and they morph over time. And like the reason people like people who are atheists say, Oh my God, that like nothing ever yeah. makes that much sense. So the fact that things don't always make sense in your world makes it feel more real. And the fact that, I mean like the sacre bleu, like what French say, which means sacred blue doesn't make any freaking sense, but it's because blue sounds like Dieu, which is God. So it's the same. It's like people saying, an Oh my gosh, instead of, Oh my God. Um, but like, it's making things like further adjustments to it like that. We are like, okay but like how might it change and what if this random thing happened that changed it even more and that just like took on and like if you make it random like that it feels more real so like the fact that we don't get an explanation for why pharaoh calls them pinks but then she's like well what color are you <laughs> you're like i mean yeah it checks out but like <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's it's stuff like that that makes it i mean dark wings dark words you know like you could see why that would become a thing and it yeah. doesn't feel too on the nose. If people were just like, I don't know if it was like bad ravens, bad, what rhymes with that? I don't know. But, you know, it could be like more on the nose and you'd be like. So it's stuff like that. It makes it feel organic. <laughs> the others take you in a song by Spire. It's a nice expression too. Yeah. George's world yeah. building is That's so good and natural in the way that he, he spreads it, you know, um, it's it's rather good we commented on it i think in book one or two we were just like look at all this world building it was so much this the fact that that's why i say don't explain everything because like in real in real life we do so many things that we do not know the explanations for we just do them yeah i mean i'm atheist in christmas slaps so but there's like also just like this hodgepodge of traditions it's not like oh well the christians do the jesus birthday and the pagans do the tree with the candles. They're like, nope, they're all kind of doing all of it. <laughs> 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 Harry Potter had muggles. Yeah. Which uh, admittedly is a very good word. I got to yeah, give it. I got to give it. Yeah. It sounds like what I mean. Don't let the muggles get you down. Yeah. <laughs> so not only the three authors we're talking about. I mean, N.K. Jemison is actually very good, I think, in Broken mm -hmm. Earth. Where I think there is the glossary. I never checked it because, like, you can pick it up from context clues what they yep. mean. Um, but it's very, it feels very in universe. It doesn't feel like these like fake made up words because this is a fantasy world. It feels very like it makes sense why the naming conventions would be the way they are and why people would talk the way they do and why this would be slang. It really helps with immersion for sure. Yeah. Um, 
I, I think George is like really good at it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's because he has so much history and lore around what he's doing. That's a good way oh, to get your readers. Yeah, Mud Blood groups. was also pretty good. Yeah, Mud Blood was also good. Angry that Muggles is a good swear. Yeah, it, it is what it is. <laughs> Mud Bloods and Muggles. I mean, it, they roll off the tongue. But like, I mean, not to this point also, not just that it's not believable that they know it. It's also unlikely that they would talk about it. Yeah, <laughs> like that's true. We like I don't sit around at Christmas explaining our own Christmas traditions to my family who know what we do and why we do it and don't need to hear me explain it. <laughs> you know, yeah. like people don't go around explaining their faith systems and their traditions all the time. They just do it. It's true. And then even that, like family traditions at a whole nother layer where like, OK, not only are there these like mixing and like a pick and mix of different faiths that got morphed over time and then commercialized and then merged and became Christmas. There's also every single family has its own traditions that sometimes make sense and sometimes really do not make sense. Like, like one year, you know, mom burned the Christmas dinner. And so we ordered pizza. And now our Christmas tradition is to have pizza on Christmas and that no one else is doing that. But like, that's our Christmas tradition is to have pizza, you know, like stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> now I want pizza. <laughs> <laughs> this is the main takeaway today <laughs> oh yeah they did that and like at first i was like yeah it's kind of cute but also got really annoying really fast yeah you never want to annoy people with like your your in-world swears i was never annoyed when pharaoh called someone a fucking pink <laughs> <laughs> oh like, yeah they are <laughs> House rules. Oh, like different people playing Monopoly different ways. <laughs> yeah, and average people don't think about culture. They don't. Or if they do, I don't know. They still don't talk about it the way that like exposition dumps <laughs> are. Right. Or or explain away all the um hypocritical things that I know. Have. So they'll like they'll be like, and you know, it doesn't really make sense that we do this, but we do it because Yeah. <laughs> You're like, okay. We're, we're constantly being hypocrites. Voice of the author here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean it does it feels almost like a fourth wall break when they're like some info dumps and some exposition is literally just like, so author here, uh just want to explain to you that this is how the world works. Okay, so back <laughs> to the story. And you're like, thanks for that. <laughs> thanks, Robert Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> not tell them why I'm doing it oh and I mean yeah the house the uh, the words for each of the houses in Song of Ice and Fire yeah and those help tremendously like we do not so hear me roar he, uh, you know, a lot of detail went into that stuff. And someone said earlier they feel like it's more organic because George is coming up with it on the spot. And I actually agree with that a lot. And that's why I, even when I write, I, I kind of like the discovery or gardener or whatever method of writing. I feel like you must be referencing something specific. So what 12-year-old orphan went on a cultural diatribe? I would like to know. Um... Maybe talking about Song of Ice Fire because the characters are young. That's what I'm assuming, but I'm not sure. I think we're talking about like books doing it badly. We're like explaining your traditions, and some twelve year old also knows like entire history of. Oh, their... prob maybe, maybe probably Harry Potter then. <laughs> Could maybe. be right. I feel like it's usually like the grown up ex because that's why I mean, as much as it is a cliche to have a fish out of water character, that's why you have them because then everybody can go around explaining things to them. Like, yeah, I don't know cool. how this world works. Like, let me tell you. That's <laughs> so why it's also uh, nice to have your main character travel somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And we've been going for quite a while, so we should probably end soon. But I'm <laughs> about to introduce like a very complicated topic. Uh, so just briefly, I think all three in very different ways are good at commenting on like um, tense relations between social classes and between races yeah definitely and they show those things not in like a we could just solve racism if we all you know like it's never that it's always and it's also never uh i think abercrombie like even said in the interview that like he hates like there's nothing worse than you know 
this is the villain. And you know how I know they're the villain? They said something racist. <laughs> like, the, like, it's never that simple. And the fact that the kind of, like, prejudice and bigotry that you find can be, like, mustache twirling top tier evil that you're like, okay, you're literally in the KKK. Okay, like, I mean, that's that's pretty as far as it goes. But there's also, like, very pedestrian, mundane forms of, like, classism and bigotry and racism that both i mean all three of these like their worlds don't shy away from showing that yeah i would agree with that and uh, it's the questions we talked about like they pose a lot of questions and the reader has to decide what they think is moral and what isn't moral mm -hmm. um you know you can come up with an answer for every single one i've even seen some people say they understand why kyle is such a dick in live ships before but hey that's their interpretation uh I feel like in first law, it's always interesting to see. It's because he was given the name Kyle at birth and he's Kyle. been raging against that his whole Kyle. life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> first law, it's always interesting to see who people cheer for in that. Um, you know, people cheer for Jamie and that's a very popular opinion. But I if feel you look at out. If you look for <laughs> it at his whole existence, you know, he's done some pretty crummy things. Um, so they're very complex questions and the answer is not always right there given to you by the author. And those are the best best things well it's also i mean like uh we like for funsies got into the topic last night like who's your favorite character and then i was like okay but i think there's two different ways to answer that there's your favorite character because like oh you love them and then there's your favorite to read about yeah because like most of first law you can't really <laughs> say you love those characters but i love reading about them and so then like in in hob books i was like okay i mean i love night eyes um but i love reading about kennett yeah. And like, I don't love Kenan. My God, I don't love Kenan. But so fascinating to yeah, read. He's a about. monster. Mon monster. But one of the best characters I've ever read in my life. Mm -hmm. Also Hobbes' favorite character. Of all of Realm of the Elderlings? Uh, I think it was uh, specifically what was her favorite antagonist, I think was the question. Oh, okay. And she said it was Kenan. Um, but I felt like she like kind of said, I think my favorite character is Kenan. Um, I mean, he's there's so many layers. Like, Jesus. Yeah. Live ship. Uh, you could do a character study on each person in the cast and, and get tons of hours out of it. I, and Ken, it did seem the most that like you could pluck him out and stick him in first law and he'd feel right at home. Certainly. <laughs> uh, and, and a lot of different series. I mean, he would just, he comes off the page. He's so good. But it's like the distinction that I, so when I was saying that, you know, Farsi or like there's things about it that are like the character works reminiscent of uh, first law and it's, it's equally as dark a lot of the time as anything in first law. Why is it not grim dark? Well, your POV is, you know, the hopeful, naive, sweet fits. It's not a cynical POV. Um, if it was first law, the POV would be regal. And so in, in live ship, when Kenneth is a POV, I was like, this is very first law of it to make Kenneth <laughs> not just in it, but be a POV. Yeah. And play with you as a reader. I mean, every on. single chapter of Kenneth's, I was like, in within one chapter, I hate you more and I like you more. And I mm -hmm. feel so confused. <laughs> yeah, you're very invested in him because of uh, people who surround him and you're constantly rooting for those people to but be like, happy. But like, even in who he is, you're like, it's not an entire 100% you're bad. It's like, there's a this is very, mm. Mm -hmm. like, I can't, I can't be against everything that you just thought and felt. Like, some of that was valid. But also yeah. it was mixed in inextricably with a lot of not great things. And like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, one of the best, uh, best formed antagonists. Probably the best antagonist I've read, honestly. I know Pierce Brown says his favorite character is uh, Adrius, the jackal. Hmm. I think he's one of the most chillingly, like one of the most chilling introductions to a villain. Like the first meeting with the jackal. Yeah, it's I like the jackal quite a bit. Very unsettling. Very. Um, but I mean, for like, uh, I was specifically talking about this in the podcast with Bethany about when Glockta goes, um, I don't think this is a spoiler because so he goes to Gurkul and, you know, there's he's been sent there to deal with the defense of the city situation. Like, that's the reason he's there. So obviously you have to like figure out like what's what, what are the resources we have? who's here, whatever. And there's like, this is a different area of the map. There's tense race relations. And the people who have been previously handling this were not doing a great job. And Glockton does not come in as like, a, it is wrong and everyone is equal. And just because they are different from you, then it is like, no, he's like, it is very impractical of you to be not utilizing the best resources. And the best resources are local workers. <laughs> so 
it's like it's it's doesn't i mean he doesn't come across as like a moral do-gooder but also mm-hmm. like it does shine a light on like these tense not great race relations where you're like I, you're showing a really bad situation and our character that we're following isn't like oh, this is atrocious this is these are humans like he's like isn't he's like and he's even called out like someone is like um, oh, you expect me to believe that like you want what's best for us? And he's like, I don't care what you believe. I definitely don't care about what's best for you. But what's best for the city is if you help us out. So, yeah, he's not he's not the paragon of righteousness, right? Yeah. And the idea of like a character coming in, like not that there aren't people who are like just you know fight for a cause for the cause's sake and would be like this is just wrong and it doesn't matter if it's impractical to do things differently. It's wrong the way things are being done. But like most of the time, the way the world works is like what is kind of what people feel like is going to get them the best, like yeah. the most uh, ideal situation for them. Yes. So like the fact that Glockta comes in and is like, I mean, I don't, I don't care that this is moral or immoral. What I know is that this is stupid. So <laughs> you should probably use the local labor. <laughs> yeah, it just turned out that his selfish act ended up, you know, coinciding maybe with what was moral. Yeah. Um, which I think like. I don't know, like the that that situation, like depicting it the way it was, where it's very clear to the audience that this is a moral wrong. Um, so like he's making the author is making the point that this is a moral wrong by showing it to us that way, where like and the other characters talking about it, you're like, oh fuck you. Um, but then not having your POV character fill in the like, you know, moral do you know Dudley do right role. Like you didn't show me a bad situation just to have the main character be like, and I will solve it. Like your main character is like, I mean this is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> That's his attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The reader's judgment of a character says more about them than the character. Certainly. Most a lot of the time. And yeah, I mean, there's nothing worse than a, a villain that is evil for evil's sake. I woke up and decided how will I be evil today? Like that's <laughs> people are always the heroes of their own stories. So Yes. Yes, we are. And I mean, the we see more like race relations specifically, like with Danny's um, plot line and where she is, because like Westeros is more homogenous. Yeah. And also, it's a it's a pretty interesting take on colonialization because Danny wants to put an end to a lot of what their culture um, had going on before mm-hmm. that that had been passed down for a long time. And some of the people even wanted it back. Uh, fighting pits is kind of what mm-hmm. I'm talking about. But and she wants to end it, but she ends up bringing it back and she's disgusted by it. But the people are loving it and it's good for the city's economy. And it's like really interesting take on I was gonna say actually both Hob and Martin do interesting things with slavery like specifically yeah. and like yep. don't just make it like i mean not that they're not never saying well sometimes it's good like they're not saying that yeah. but like the way that they're making it not just like a well you end it and you're like okay sometimes it's it's really not that simple yeah um so like in live ship traders and you know the handling of slavery there and the way that plays into just all the themes and then like you just said danny and the slavery and her part of the world is it's a very messy, complicated gray. Well, it's always about it. what happens next. It's yeah. kind of what Danny's story is all about. Um, well, you can't just like disrupt a system if you don't have a replacement. Correct. Correct. A lot of people want to topple things and not think about what mm-hmm. the next step is. Which is why you need to read the next Red Rising books. <laughs> when he's done. We finished, you know, because we did the toppling, but like, what now? Once he finishes it, I'm in. You know, he submitted a draft for book six. That's what I've heard. That's awesome. Which is also because he like he tossed like 600 pages that he had written before and was like, nope, I'm starting that's again. Scary. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> yeah, that's scary. But he said he tossed it because it was too dark. And I was like, oh, my God, because <laughs> Dark Age is very dark. And he didn't think that was too dark to publish. So his sixth book, he was like, that's too dark. I can't publish that. I was like, my God. Hmm. colors what is in that (laughs) yeah exactly okay any other thoughts I like all three of these authors very much (laughs) I think I know who your favorite is. (laughs) 
Um, so yeah, we have our. I think we've stated our case. Yeah, they are <laughs> the best in the biz. I have my homework to read the rest of the realm of the elderlings. Yes. Yes, you do. And I need to read Duncan Egg for our discussion next uh, next week. I need to read The Wolf and King Killer Chronicle. Yeah, I know. I got a lot. I got a lot of stuff. I'm going to start Janny Wartz's 11 book series because I'm a madman. So that's going to be interesting. What series? Exactly. Uh, Wars of Light and Shadow by Janny Wartz. It is. Um, I've heard a lot of people that I respect say it's the most underrated fantasy series of all time. It's supposed to be extraordinarily complex. Um, and it has like four or five individual arcs and the last book comes out this year, um, which is the book 11. So I'm really pumped and I've heard that her writing is insanely good. So really excited about it. Well, you certainly sell it. Well, yeah, <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll let you know. You can be the guinea pig. If yes. You come back and you're like, I read yeah. it. And you're like, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have very high hopes. Very, very high. hopes. But you have to keep them low when you go into it. Yes. So that you won't be disappointed. Of course. <laughs> um, but thanks for coming on to chat about these authors that we always chat about. <laughs> Anytime. And, and we'll be talking again for hours next Sunday. And it, it, we it's sure will. Fun. I was going to say, it feels a little weird to be sober and talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you made it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's more impressive that we can go that long and not be sober. Yeah, I would agree. But it's easy when you're talking about these three. Yeah. And then, I mean, me and Alex don't have to do anything. We just kind of like mention a thing and then watch you go like, oh, and it's so good because, oh, guys, guys, do you know it's that it's so actually, he actually said <laughs> it's confirmed. And I looked this up and like, I wasn't imagining it. It's confirmed. <laughs> that is me. I will, I, I fully own that very it's much my so. Impersonation of <laughs> so good. Oh no. Oh, I should send it to you. Um, someone did um Trump as Gollum. Like, we want the precious, we need the precious, we're gonna get the precious. Oh, no. It's so good. Oh, it was stolen, but we're gonna it get works. it back. It's it so works. Good. <laughs> okay, well, on that note. <laughs> Uh, thanks everybody for the lovely chat and Jimmy for chatting and just the ch all the chatting and the chatting. <laughs> <laughs> See you next time. Bye everyone.